Hi, it's Katrina. Alien Signals In June of 2022, China's science ministry claimed that they picked up signals on one of their telescopes that may have come from an alien civilization. It was a pretty bold claim, one backed up by scientists at Beijing Normal University. They said that these signals were identified using the country's Sky Eye Telescope and that these signals appeared to be very suspicious. The signals were so suspicious that researchers began looking into possible traces of intelligent civilizations somewhere else in the universe, or rather in the more immediate cosmos. Zhang Tanji, chief scientist of a Chinese extraterrestrial civilization search team, said the electromagnetic signals picked up by the telescope differ drastically from any previously captured signals. And while the researchers in China are desperately seeking an answer to the mysterious signals, they have also admitted that it could just be radio interference. There is no definitive way yet to tell if we've actually found a civilization just like ours living on a different planet thousands of light years away. But there's another mysterious thing that happened. Shortly after the report came out by the official Ministry of Science, the report was removed from China's state-backed website with no explanation. But it was already too late. It had been redistributed by news outlets all over the world. The Truth of the Black Death Scientists have just made a rather bizarre discovery involving the Black Death. It's still considered to be the deadliest epidemic in human history, but it may not have been killing people as indiscriminately as previously believed. Until 2022, researchers were convinced that everyone was at equal risk to be killed by the plague. And it made sense considering the plague wiped out roughly 75 million people between 1347 and 1351. But according to Sharon DeWitt, a biological anthropologist from the University of Albany, the Black Death killed people a lot more like how COVID-19 kills people. It specifically targeted humans that were at high risk. What that means is that people who were already weakened by some other affliction and who were too weak to fight off the infection would be the ones who died. This information didn't come easily. Sharon and her colleagues had to study over 490 skeletons from the East Smithfield Black Death Cemetery in London. The scientists looked at the bones of these skeletons, searching for any indication of frailty. And what they found was that the people who were killed by the plague were already unhealthy. These people were vulnerable, had poor nutrition, compromised immune systems, and very little ability to fight the disease. It goes to show that people in the Middle Ages were generally unhealthy and may be deprived of nutrients. It was this general poor condition of their bodies that caused Europe to be nearly wiped off the map. Giants on Europa There may just be gigantic sea monsters swimming in the chilly waters on Jupiter's ice moon Europa. We haven't technically discovered any monsters yet, but scientists are confident there could be abysmal beasts lurking on Jupiter's moon. And here's why. Even in the darkest and most inhospitable regions of Earth, where there is no light, barely any food, and the temperature is only just above freezing, life finds a way to thrive. There are nightmare squids and gigantic isopods, and even killer jellyfish living in the harshest places of the ocean. And now, here's where Europa comes in. According to Tim Shank, a biologist with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts, Life on Europa could resemble life in the deepest places on Earth because the environments are quite similar. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. It's a gas giant and it has quite a few moons. Europa is perhaps the most interesting because scientists with NASA believe that underneath its frozen surface is liquid water. NASA has even seen Europa spit liquid into space suggesting it actually squirts some of its own water out into the void. As we already know, where there is water, there is almost always life. Given the sheer size of the oceans on Europa, we could be dealing with an entire world of water monsters, sea serpents, and alien creatures. Do you think it's possible giant sea monsters are hiding on Jupiter's moon? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Exotic Black Hole In a galaxy adjacent to our own, astronomers have discovered something absolutely wild. 
They have called it a cosmic needle in a haystack. A discovery so astounding, it's a miracle it was made at all. The discovery is that of a mysterious, dormant, exotic black hole that was born under curious circumstances. Most black holes are created when a dying star explodes, a supernova, but this one wasn't. It's also not emitting powerful radiation, meaning it isn't swallowing up material like a black hole typically should. It doesn't have a strong gravitational pull. So then, how in the world is this even a black hole? It still has a mass nine times greater than the Sun. It's hanging out in the Tarantula Nebula, about 160,000 light years from Earth. It also appears to be orbiting with an extremely luminous hot blue star that has a mass of over 25 times the Sun, making it larger than the black hole. These two objects make up a binary system, and it's all a little bizarre. The reason it was so difficult to identify this black hole is because it doesn't interact with its surroundings. Normally, astronomers can see a black hole because it sucks the light out of everything near it, but that's not the case with this one. This is the first time astronomers have actually identified something like this, and it took them six years to find. It was most likely created by the collapse of a star at the end of its life cycle without an explosion. It's a dark hole in the universe that doesn't gobble up everything near it. It's just a swirling pocket of nothing without the deadly gravitational forces like most black holes. The Artificial Star Not only is China on the lookout for alien civilizations, but they are also busy creating an unlimited energy source right here on Earth. China has created an artificial sun, and in 2022, it broke the record for the longest sustained nuclear fusion ever. According to Smithsonian Magazine, China's artificial sun superheated plasma to reach a temperature of 126 million degrees Fahrenheit. The plasma then maintained that temperature for 17 minutes straight. Let's break down how hot that is for a second. 126 million degrees Fahrenheit is roughly five times hotter than the sun. Not the surface of the sun, which radiates 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the core of the sun, which burns at only 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. That means that here on our planet, in China, there is an artificial star that can create more heat and energy than the actual sun, the very thing responsible for all life on Earth. The machine is called Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak. It's been in operation since 2006 and could very well solve the planet's energy crisis. Nuclear fusion could be the cleanest energy source since it replicates the physics of the sun by merging atomic nuclei to create large amounts of energy into electricity. It's a process which requires no fuel at all, which leaves behind no nuclear waste and doesn't require a big, ugly nuclear power plant. China is at the forefront of this technology, creating their own stars contained in machines of metal. One day, these machines could be responsible for limitless clean energy. The Balancing Rock NASA's Perseverance roves landed on the surface of Mars on February 18, 2021. Since then, the robot has been busy exploring an area known as the Jezero Crater. This crater was made when something smashed into the surface of the planet over 3.5 billion years ago. According to NASA scientists, shortly after the crater was made, it may have been filled with water or a lake teeming with microbial life. That's a pretty big deal considering all life on Earth started the exact same way. Microbial specimens floating around in a great big petri dish. Thanks to the rover, scientists have already found evidence of ancient rivers flowing into the crater. This suggests that billions of years ago, Mars was a very different place. It was blue and maybe even green, although that hasn't been proven yet. And this leads us to the balancing rock. The Perseverance sent a picture back to NASA of a rock balanced almost perfectly on top of a boulder. The rock appears to be about the size of a bowling ball. The mystery is that nobody knows how the rock got into such a precarious position. It looks as though someone had balanced it there on purpose. Perhaps an alien living somewhere on the Martian surface. Of course, geologists have been quick to denounce the discovery as nothing but a freak phenomenon. Weathering and erosion could have caused the rock to morph into a circular shape, 
to make it look as though it's balancing. Even if that's true, it's still another awesome discovery from the Red Planet. The James Webb Telescope The James Webb Space Telescope has made a big splash in the scientific community, and people are getting excited about space again. Just one week after NASA released the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope, it made its first major discovery. Astronomers say that the telescope has potentially allowed them to view the most distant galaxy anyone has ever seen. We have now taken a picture of the oldest galaxy ever found, and it dates back 13.5 billion years. What this means is that the galaxy formed 300 million years following the birth of the universe, or the Big Bang. It's one of the first galaxies to ever exist, and we took a picture of it. Now here is some interesting information. The age of a particular galaxy is determined by something called redshift. As the universe expands outward in all directions, the wavelength of light becomes stretched deeper into the red spectrum. The more red the image is, the farther the galaxy is from where we are. And that's how this new galaxy's age was determined. The Death of the Paddlefish The Chinese paddlefish has officially been declared extinct. In one of the bleakest discoveries of the year, the International Union for Conservation of Nature confirmed in July of 2022 that the Chinese paddlefish is gone. It was last seen in the wild in 2003 and is now, beyond any doubt, completely gone from our planet. And that's not all the IUCN discovered. They completed a comprehensive investigation on the state of sturgeon and paddlefish worldwide, and it's not good. 26 of the remaining species of both kinds of fish are under threat of extinction, with two-thirds critically endangered. This was a pretty big fish, too. The Chinese paddlefish was native to the Yangtze River. It grew to be over 23 feet long, and it was a truly amazing creature. In fact, scientists say it had been around since the Lower Jurassic period, meaning it had lived with dinosaurs 200 million years ago. But now, thanks to overfishing, the construction of a dam, and a steady decline in China's wild places since the 1980s, the Chinese paddlefish is no longer. The fish had survived the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, only to be killed off by humanity. Exposed Glacier Rocks In 2022, the Canadian city of Victoria, the capital of British Columbia, was experiencing some very low tides. The receding water was exposing all kinds of cool stuff along the shore, like a giant slab of granite at a rocky beach near the Chinese cemetery in Oak Bay. But according to University of Victoria professor Edwin Nissen, this was no ordinary piece of granite. It was a chunk of rock that had traveled hundreds of miles from northern Vancouver on a glacier to reach the beach in Victoria, and it did it between 10,000 to 20,000 years ago. The rock began its travels during the Pleistocene era, which was during the Ice Age. Near the end of that time, there were enormous glaciers covering everywhere from the coastal mountains of British Columbia to Vancouver Island and out into the Pacific Ocean. It was a gigantic ice sheet, and it was rapidly melting. Over the course of roughly 10,000 years, the consistent melting of the glacier ripped rocks up from the surface and sent them sliding along its bulk like kids going down a water slide. As the glaciers melted, huge chunks of rock ended up hundreds of miles away from where they had started. And that brings us back to the giant hunk of granite in Oak Bay. It's an igneous rock that made it all the way from Vancouver to the beach of Victoria, which is a pretty impressive trip for an inanimate object. The Domestication of Olives Scientists in Israel have discovered where olives were first domesticated. Researchers from the University of Tel Aviv recently revealed that 7,000 years ago, inhabitants of the Jordan Valley domesticated olives for the first time. That might not sound that interesting, but olives have been a staple in world cuisine since biblical times and have been eaten around the world for thousands of years. Yet nobody was really sure where the first olive tree grew. Not until now. It's an exciting discovery comparable to finding where the first apple was grown. According to Dr. Daphne Langut, the team's study leader, they discovered the first domesticated olive trees by looking at charcoal remains. The thing is that even when trees are burned down to nothing but charcoal, modern scientists can still identify them based on anatomic structure. 
And since olive trees grow wild in Israel, but not wild in the Jordan Valley, somebody must have brought them here. 7,000 years ago, somebody in Israel realized that they could take a tree from one place, bring it to a new place, and grow whatever kind of plants they wanted. This was an incredible revelation, considering people weren't really even building cities back then. The olive tree would have been planted by primitive humans outside a prehistoric village. They were basically Stone Age gardeners and the world's first botanists, domesticating trees before they had even invented the wheel. Indestructible Mars Microbes There may be significantly more life on Mars than anyone could have ever anticipated. Researchers recently made a shocking discovery that ancient bacteria could be hiding underneath the Martian surface. It may have been there shielded from radiation and the harsh conditions for millions of years. For the time being, there hasn't been any true evidence of life that's been found on the Red Planet. Instead, researchers simulated Martian conditions in a laboratory here on Earth. They were curious to see how bacteria and fungi might react in a Martian environment. Scientists were shocked to discover that bacteria is able to survive for at least 280 million years if it's buried under the surface. What this suggests is that if life ever did exist on Mars, which most scientists believe it did, there is a possibility that it could exist again. Dormant life forms could be slumbering underneath the subsurface of the planet. But the issue with finding these life forms is that we need better technology to reach them. We would need to create a Martian rover that can drill into the soil to take samples. This study was done by researchers at Northwestern University. The team says the reason life is currently unrealistic on Mars is due to the lack of water both flowing and in the atmosphere. Because there is no water, cells and spores would automatically dry out. The surface temperature of Mars is also about the same as dry ice, which makes sustaining life more than a little tricky. These same scientists discovered that a microbe named Deinococcus radiodurans, Conan the bacterium, is surprisingly suited to life in the inhospitable Martian wasteland. It can survive extremely harsh conditions even freezing temperatures and dehydration. It's so hardy that it can live for almost 300 million years. It can also survive 28,000 times more radiation than the typical amount of exposure that would kill a person. Pink Auroras A solar storm smashed into the planet in early November of 2022. Scientists have known about solar storms for decades, but their potential for damage has always been something of a mystery. Some have speculated that a particularly bad solar storm could wipe out all electronics on the planet, sending us back into the Dark Ages. This time, the solar storm punched a hole in the planet's magnetic field. It didn't wipe out everyone's electronics, but it did create a marvelous display of color. In the area above Norway, where the hole was made, people witnessed a rare light show. Pink auroras illuminated the night sky like something you would expect to see on an alien planet. Marcus Varick, a local tour guide, told Live Science that he had never seen anything like it in over a decade of leading tours. He even called it a humbling experience. The pink auroras lit up the sky after the crack emerged in the magnetic field. And then, something even more wild happened. After about six hours, the hole in the magnetic sphere sealed itself. And then a blue ring emerged in the sky like a portal to another dimension. Scientists are still baffled as to what in the world happened and what it means for the future. Radioactive Tree Rings Researchers have recently discovered evidence of radiation storms that have swept across our planet periodically over the last 10,000 years. Scientists analyzed radioactive signatures found on tree rings across the globe in order to study this interesting phenomenon. They did this by looking at radioactive carbon-14, also known as radiocarbon. Apparently, when radiation hits the atmosphere, it turns nitrogen atoms into radiocarbon. The radiocarbon then filters through pretty much everything, including plants and animals. There is even evidence of this that can be observed in tree rings. Because radiocarbon gradually decays back into nitrogen, scientists can use it for radiocarbon dating. It's a natural clock that's reliable for millions of years. When it comes to tree rings, 
Scientists can read the radiocarbon to get a firm record of cosmic rays penetrating the atmosphere. Normally, cosmic rays are perpetually blasting our planet. However, in 2012, Japanese physicist Fusa Miyake discovered an anomaly. He looked at tree rings made in the year 774 AD and found a full year of cosmic radiation that hit the tree at the same time. More researchers found similar events at various intervals going all the way back to 7176 BC and through to 993 AD. It's a huge mystery because nobody knows what it means. It seems to suggest that there are huge explosions of cosmic energy hitting Earth once every few thousand or few hundred years. But it seems to be completely random. If it happens again, nobody knows what the consequences might be. UFO Scraps In 1957, there were newspaper reports of an unidentified flying object, something that appeared to be a flying saucer with a copper bottom that crashed on Silpho Moor near Scarborough in the United Kingdom. The object itself was recovered, tested, and examined thoroughly. The alleged spaceship turned out to be of terrestrial origin, yet nobody was entirely sure what the thing was. It looked like a small flying saucer that could have been piloted by very tiny extraterrestrials. To make matters even more confusing, there were mysterious reports that the metallic saucer contained thin copper sheets engraved with hieroglyphics. As far as experts are concerned, the UFO was an elaborate hoax. The item was tested by researchers at the Natural History Museum and the University of Manchester, and they determined it didn't come from space. The hieroglyphics were likely carved into the mystery object by someone who thought it would make for a good news story. And yet, this isn't where the story ends. The Science Museum, where the mystery object is currently being held, also has within its collection a cigarette tin. Allegedly, inside the tin are three curious scraps from an unknown device. The pieces were also discovered at Silpho Moor and may have something to do with the original copper-bottomed saucer. Researchers believe there could be hundreds of these metallic scraps that were taken by curious scavengers in the 1950s. The pieces are more than likely lost these days or stashed in boxes in people's attics. Nobody knows what it all means, but many speculate these scraps are from an alien ship that broke apart on impact. This incident has been compared to the Roswell incident in New Mexico in the 1940s. In fact, the two alleged alien crashes were only a decade apart. Malcolm's Road Beach Malcolm's Road Beach is a secluded stretch of coastline located in Turks and Caicos. The beach offers beautiful white sand, turquoise waters, and clear blue skies. Tourists that visit this place mostly care about relaxing in the sun and enjoying the quiet, but there is a lot more going on here. The beach is very close to the drop-off edge of the Caicos Islands Plateau, which suddenly drops to over 7,000 feet deep. This isn't the only surprise along Malcolm's Road Beach either. The beautiful white sand is made of broken coral and shell matter. These fine grains of sand are the result of dead and decayed coral being worn out over time. But these days, the coral reefs aren't as plentiful as they once were. And for that reason, you can find artificial reefs here. One of the artificial reefs found at Malcolm's Road Beach is a rather bizarre geological feature. From above, it looks as if there are huge holes on the sea floor. But in fact, these are concrete artificial reef balls. They have been placed all along the beach to help facilitate coral growth and to shelter fish. Viking Treasure Hoard A man equipped with his metal detector went on a walk in a field near his house in Norway when he stumbled upon something very interesting. This was an activity he enjoyed doing on occasion, with the small shred of hope that one day, he would find treasure. Then, just before Christmas of 2021, he did just that. Pavel Bednarski discovered one of the most impressive Viking Age silver hoards in all of Europe. He first uncovered some fragments a couple inches under the soil. Then he found rings, ancient Arabic coins, and a silver bracelet. He reached out to historians and archaeologists, and what followed was the unveiling of a major Viking treasure in Norway. Silver fragments found in the soil were dated at 1,100 years old. They were crafted in the 8th century at the height of Viking exploration. 
This was a period of time when Vikings were pillaging much of Europe's coastlines and building settlements in unknown lands. But here's where things get even more fascinating. The silver treasure was all found to be broken into pieces. Things like silver plates, scales, and fragments of jewelry. It was all broken so that each piece roughly weighed the exact same. Researchers believe this was because the silver was being used as currency. Instead of trading a giant silver plate for a chicken, the plate was smashed into individual pieces to turn them into specific units of currency. This was long before real coins started to be used in Europe. In total, there were 46 silver fragments dug out of the earth, weighing only 1.5 ounces or 42 grams. That's around the weight of a golf ball. And yet it's believed all the silver combined could have been bartered for a little more than half a cow, which would have been quite valuable at the time. Ancient Migration Patterns Scientists recently completed a study that revealed surprising migration patterns in South America from thousands of years ago. In order to understand the importance of this discovery, we have to go back about 30,000 years. This was a time when the first human beings from Siberia traveled across the Bering Strait land bridge to the coastline of America. Many of these people sailed along the coast until they arrived in South America. These migrants then dispersed in many different directions, but scientists have never been able to trace their movements. Just recently, though, researchers from Florida Atlantic University sequenced DNA taken from human skeletons found at prehistoric sites in Brazil. The scientists then used computational genetic analysis to recreate the original migration pattern of the first humans to live in South America. What they found is that ancient people moved up and down the Atlantic coast, building small settlements as they went. They followed a route of about 3,270 miles, linking Panama with Brazil and ancient Uruguay. What they found was that many of the original inhabitants of South America shared DNA with indigenous Australians. This discovery was shocking because nobody knows how that happened. There is an entire ocean separating Australia from South America. Yet somehow the indigenous people of both places had very similar DNA. To this day, it's still a huge mystery. Some have even speculated that Australians somehow crafted primitive boats and crossed the sea tens of thousands of years ago. The Stone City of the Huns On the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea, in the grassy plains of Kazakhstan, a mysterious stone complex was recently identified. The complex is about 1,500 years old and spans an area of roughly 200 American football fields. Multiple stone structures were found here, all of them ruined and heavily eroded. The smallest structure appears to be some kind of house, about 13 feet by 13 feet. The biggest structure looks to be a communal building, 112 feet long and likely designed for holding large gatherings. Everything here was made of stone, and some of the monuments even look like stone circles that you might find in England. The mysterious stone city was first identified in 2010 by a local man with a metal detector. However, nobody was allowed to do research here until 2014 because of the complex political situation in the area. All these years later, the site has still barely been investigated because of its location in Kazakhstan. But there are still some theories surrounding it. Experts believe the ancient stone city was built by the Huns around the same time the Roman Empire collapsed. The Huns were a nomadic tribe of people who ravaged Europe starting in the 4th century. They were part of the reason that Rome fell to ruin, and they entered Europe from the chilly Eurasian steppes. This stone city, which is in such poor shape that very little archaeological evidence has been found, may have been one of their strongholds. They could have lived here before and after they started sacking European cities. The true mystery is that nobody knows why the city was abandoned, or if it really was the Huns who built it. Researchers also don't understand what possible function this place served in the Dark Ages. Slovakian Bigfoot Bigfoot may have just been discovered in Slovakia. A person walking through the dense mountain forest heard something strange and started recording. They captured on camera a blurry, snarling creature that seemed to be shaking the trees. Like most Bigfoot sightings, this one is impossible to verify. 
The footage is indistinct and unreliable, although it does show some kind of humanoid being growling and making other strange noises in the bushes. It could have been a Bigfoot, a European Yeti, or it may have been nothing but an agitated bear. However, the person recording the video didn't stick around long enough to find out and instead took off running. Sunken Warship The wreckage of a warship from the 17th century was recently uncovered near the island of Vaxholm in Sweden. The ship called the Ablet was deliberately sunk in 1659 to make a blockade outside Stockholm to protect it from seaborne attacks. The thought was that by sinking vessels in the waterways leading to the city, the citizens could prevent attacks from pirates and other marine menaces. The ship sank about three decades after its sister ship the Vasa sank on her maiden voyage in 1628. At the time these ships were built, they were some of the most advanced pieces of naval engineering in the world. The Vasa was a particularly impressive vessel and was basically a floating war machine. The ship was 226 feet long and was armed with an impressive 64 guns. It was also capable of firing 24-pound cannonballs, which were able to blast apart lesser vessels within moments. However, after the Vasa sailed only 4,000 feet away from its anchorage in Stockholm Harbor, a gust of wind pushed it over and it sank. The applet was completed a year later and then deliberately destroyed after three decades of war with the Netherlands, Denmark, and Poland. Nobody except the scientists investigating the wreckage currently knows where it is. The applet's exact location is being kept a secret by Swedish archaeologists because it happens to be in a sensitive military area. The only people allowed down there right now are workers from the Museum of Wrecks and a handful of authorized Navy personnel. Pula Arena The Pula Arena is one of the most impressive amphitheaters ever built by the Roman Empire. It was constructed far from the Eternal City to the south in what is now Croatia. The Pula Arena was built in the 1st century AD, just years after the Roman Empire was established. Emperor Vespasian was the one behind the construction of the arena, the same guy who had the brilliant idea of creating the Colosseum in the heart of Rome. And yes, both arenas held bloody tournaments and savage combat. It was here in Croatia where gladiators fought to the death and knights held tournaments to see who was the better fighter. The Pula Arena is so important to Croatians, it's on their currency. It marked one of the most prosperous times for the region, even if it was just shy of 2,000 years ago. Because the town of Pula is situated right on the Mediterranean coast, it was an excellent place to receive goods from distant civilizations. There was also a modern road which led between Pula, Aquilia, and Rome. All that traffic with donkey caravans and brave adventurers moving to and fro, the city made a fortune, but the good times didn't last. The arena could originally hold 23,000 spectators and had a massive iron gate protecting them from the dangers on the arena floor. But by the time the Middle Ages rolled around, the arena was deserted. It was used by local farmers for grazing cattle. Only every now and then would the Knights of Malta show up and use the deserted amphitheater for a fair. Tel Arad Tel Arad is one of the most important biblical sites in Israel that still stands to this very day. It can be found west of the Dead Sea, near the modern city of Arad in an area hemmed by tall, dusty mountain peaks. The ancient city began as a small settlement about 6,000 years ago during the Copper Age. Then, in the Bronze Age, around 3500 BC, the Canaanite civilization established their city here. The original city probably had no more than 2,500 residents. Tel Arad thrived in the center of a trading route for just over 1,500 years before the Israelites attacked and defeated the Canaanites. The Canaanites were kicked out of their ancestral home and the Israelites continued to prosper there. But the Israelites weren't the only ones who liked the city. Between the 9th and 6th centuries BC, Tel Arad was decimated no less than six times. 
It was destroyed in 701 BC by the Assyrians and in 587 BC by the Babylonians. Despite all the damage, all the pillaging, and all the violence, the city's foundations are still strong. Researchers believe this is because the Canaanites used natural materials for the construction of their buildings. They used local stone and earth to construct the most naturalistic city possible, which has allowed it to withstand 5,000 years of brutal punishment by the desert. The city was such an important place to the Israelites that it could be found in various books of the Bible. The Book of Numbers discusses the attack on the Israelites by King Arad as they made their way to the Promised Land, something that may or may not have happened. And in the Book of Judges, there is a story about how the descendants of Moses' father-in-law settled in Arad. Big shout out to Tazil Simon in Canada and David Bratcher! Thank you so much for the super thanks and for spending time with us. We really appreciate your donations. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Torreon One of the oldest modern buildings in New Mexico is a stone fortification built by Hispanic settlers in the 1840s or 1850s. The tower, called the Torreon, was built before the United States was a country. This was just before the Lincoln County War of 1878 to 1881. It was during that war that Billy the Kid walked into the local courthouse in the town of Lincoln, murdered two deputies, then rode away on a stolen horse. These were the days of the Wild West, and the Torreon is one of the few remaining monuments of that period in American history. The town of Lincoln is as close as you can get to a snapshot of the 1800s. The original courthouse is still standing, and so too is the jail. Lincoln has been called the most authentic Wild West town in the United States. But even before this old western town became the epicenter of a bloody battle, the Torreon stood as a defensive tower. Have you ever been to a Wild West town before? Let me know in the comments! Mistress The ancient city of Mistress was where the very last emperor of the Byzantine Empire was crowned, Emperor Constantine XI in 1443 AD. Today, it stands abandoned on the slopes of the majestic Taygetus Mountains in Sparta, Greece. This fantastic deserted city still commands unparalleled views of the Laconian Plain, the place where Spartan warriors thrived over 2,000 years ago. The highest point of the city is the fortress of Vil Harduin, named after the Prince of Achaia. Achaia was a crusader state controlled by the Holy Roman Empire after the end of the Fourth Crusade in 1204. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the mountain town experienced a great spell of prosperity. Culture flourished, the city attracted thinkers and scientists, and artists flooded the streets. During the Ottoman period, travelers in the region mistook the city of Mistress for being the capital of ancient Sparta. After the village was abandoned in the 1830s, a new town was built nearby and named Sparty, keeping the legend of the Spartans alive, even though they had nothing to do with Mistress. The city only came about because of the original fortress built in the 13th century. These days, Mistress still stands. It was introduced as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1989. Even the great Pantanasa Monastery is still standing in extraordinary detail. Castillo de San Marcos the Castillo de San Marcos is the oldest surviving masonry fort in the continental United States. It was built on the western shore of the Matanzas Bay in Florida by Spanish engineer Ignacio Daza almost 400 years ago. The city of St. Augustine, where the fort stands, was founded in the 15th century by conquistador Pedro Menéndez de Aviles. Originally, Florida was part of the Spanish Empire. What a lot of people don't realize is just how much of the United States belonged to places like Spain and France. After the English raided St. Augustine, in 1668, the local Spanish governor demanded a fort be built to protect the rest of Florida. The first stones were laid in 1672, and the fortress was finished two decades later. True, it underwent several alterations over the following decades, but the fortress is still largely original. The Castillo de San Marcos has a very dark history. The construction in the 17th century was almost entirely thanks to slaves owned by the Spanish. But shortly after its construction, Spain began to change their views on slavery. The fortress became a point of entry for fugitive slaves escaping British-controlled North America. Slaves ran from the British, arrived in Florida, and the Spanish freed them. This resulted in some of the first freed black settlements in what would soon become the United States. The Maresha Caves Bet Guvrin Maresha is a massive archaeological park encompassing a handful of ancient sites. 
including a crusader fortress and subterranean nightmare. The whole region was initially part of an Iron Age settlement called Maresha, which became one of the first cities of the Kingdom of Judah during the days of the First Temple. That was between the 10th and 6th centuries BC. It continued to be occupied by Judeans until the conquest of Alexander the Great around 330 BC. Maresha was then occupied by the Greeks, primarily by retired Greek soldiers leaving Alexander's army. It was later conquered by the Sidonians, the Nabataeans, and later the Greeks again, before being destroyed in 40 BC by the Parthians. What's truly amazing about Marisha and the surrounding area is that underneath the surface is a hidden labyrinth of subterranean caves. There are over 500 caves, 3,500 rooms, and almost 800 acres of tunnels. The caves form a serpentine maze, a labyrinth of tombs, storage chambers, burials, and even pens for farm animals. It's not clear why such a vast network of underground rooms was built, but it could have had something to do with trying to avoid foreign invaders. Most of the caves were carved between the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, shortly after Mauritia was taken by Alexander. With all the war happening, the locals likely dug an underground city to try and hide themselves in case they were conquered again. All these years later, you could still shelter a small city inside the underground passages, which have barely aged at all. Would you like to explore the Marisha Caves? I would. Hanam Nagar Panam Nagar is an abandoned city in Bangladesh that once prospered as a wealthy town of Hindu merchants, but its history is a little complex. The city was first occupied around the 13th century and went under the name of Sonar Gaon. The area was entirely controlled by the Muslims who governed over the Sultanate of Bengal starting in 1338, but then, 300 years later, the Mughal Empire showed up and decimated the Muslims who had been in control. And that was when Sonar Gaon and other nearby cities started to flourish. The Mughals connected the main metropolis to other settlements by constructing extensive highway systems, carving out long canals and building bridges. Many of these highways and bridges still exist today. In the 19th century, Sonar Gaon became a bustling trading center. This was during the English occupation when colonial powers were extracting as many goods as they could get their hands on, primarily cotton fabrics. There were over 1,400 families of weavers living in and around the city, selling their wares to the British East India Company. When a group of wealthy Hindu merchants returned to their homeland from Kolkata after being away, they built a small township over the ruins of the earlier Sonar Gaon. They then changed the name to Panam Nagar, and that's what the place is known as today. The wealthy Hindu merchants lived in the small neighborhood and continued to prosper until around the end of the Second World War. In 1947, race riots caused the city to be deserted. Panam Nagar and the medieval ruins of Sonar Gaon are still deserted to this very Every day, yet they still stand strong. Tower of Hercules The Tower of Hercules has been standing proudly at the entrance of La Coruña Harbor in northwestern Spain since at least the first century. The Romans originally built the tower as a lighthouse to show where the entrance to the harbor was. Makes sense. It was built on a massive rock rising 150 feet from the turbulent sea. The tower itself then rises another 150 feet into the sky. It is officially the oldest surviving lighthouse on the planet, looking so new you might think it was built a few decades ago. But not all of the tower was built by the Romans. The true origin of the structure is a mystery. Some archaeologists say Emperor Trajan built the lighthouse on the foundations of a much earlier lighthouse constructed by the Phoenicians hundreds of years earlier. Others suggest it may have copied the original plans of the Lighthouse of Alexandria. It's all extremely mysterious, which makes the monument that much more exciting. The reason the lighthouse is in such good shape is because it underwent renovations in the 18th century. Architect Eustachio Gianni modified the Roman foundation and added 60 additional feet to the structure. It's only because of his work that the Tower of Hercules looks so new and fresh, even though it's 2,000 years old. Chanquillo The Chanquillo Astronomical Complex was built 2,250 years ago on the northern coast of Peru. Scientists believe it functioned as a giant desert calendar, using the sun to identify the days and weeks of the year. The site includes several major pieces of architecture that are still standing to this day. There's the hilltop complex of the fortified temple, the observatory and the administrative center, and 13 viewing towers positioned
positioned on the ridge line. The entire complex was dedicated to watching the sky and understanding the movement of celestial objects. It may very well have been one of the greatest astronomical centers anywhere in the world. But who were the brilliant astronomers studying the cosmos here? According to UNESCO World Heritage, the ceremonial center was likely dedicated to a solar cult. In other words, there was a group of dedicated astronomers who lived here full-time and kept their eyes on the sky. It's a fascinating place because it's in the middle of the desert. This is a wasteland, somewhere you would never expect anyone to live. Never mind build an ancient observatory. The 13 viewing towers are still visible like spines on the back of a giant sand dune. As for the culture responsible for Chanquillo, that was likely the Kazma Sachin culture. They prospered in the dry and arid coastline from between 3600 and 200 BC. That is a huge amount of time for a single culture to live in the same place. Archaeologists say the Kazma Sechin culture may have formed from the remnants of the even older Caral Supe civilization, still considered the oldest advanced civilization to live in the Americas. The Roman Forum the Roman Forum is kind of still standing. It had to be excavated because it was in ruins and buried underneath the city of Rome, but it was eventually put back together. Or rather, some parts of it were put back together. The Forum was rediscovered by Carlo Fea in 1803, with excavations taking over 100 years. It wouldn't be fully revealed until a century later, but even after so long being destroyed and buried under rubble, the Roman Forum still stood with enough intact fragments that modern archaeologists were able to put a lot of it back together again. Visitors can view the partially reconstructed Roman Forum today, getting a pretty good idea of what it originally looked like 2,500 years ago. Have you ever been there? Let me know in the comments! But what was the Roman Forum? It was originally built in the center of the historic city of Rome around 500 BC. It was an open-air meeting area where members of Roman society held public meetings regarding all things religious, political, and social. Historians believe it was right here in the shadow of the Forum's pillars that the Roman Republic was founded. Many people call it the birthplace of democracy. The Forum remained the meeting place for the members of the Republic until the overcrowding started. By the time Julius Caesar showed up 500 years later, Rome was too busy. They couldn't fit all the important members of the Senate inside the Forum. Caesar had to build a new government building, leaving the old one to be slowly buried under Rome as it grew into a Empire. Dark Age Prosthetics The oldest functional prosthetic body part in the world is a big toe. There are two preserved examples of artificial toes crafted during the days of ancient Egypt. The toes are older than any other prosthesis, including the extremely advanced Roman capula leg. The reason the toes were so functional was that ancient Egyptians understood a lot about human anatomy. They may not have known entirely why, but they knew the toe was important. Our toes, specifically our big toes, are believed to carry roughly 40% of our body weight. It's the big toe that gives us forward propulsion and helps us walk. In modern times, toe prosthetics are created using advanced cameras and other pieces of sophisticated monitoring equipment. Nobody knows how they did it in ancient Egypt over 2,000 years ago. But the Egyptians weren't the only ones to come up with incredible prosthetic technology. In the Dark Age, Gods von Berlichingen became one of the first to truly create prosthetic limbs. He lived between 1480 and 1562, serving as a German knight under the rule of Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. It was Berlichingen who took the development of artificial limbs to the next level. He experimented with hinges and articulated fingers. This allowed men who lost their arms in combat to keep fighting. They could hold shields and swing swords, just like any man with two arms. The prosthetics of the Dark Age were so advanced, we didn't really make any additional progress for roughly 400 years. It wouldn't be until the American Civil War that artificial limbs became big business. And so the technology advanced. It's shadow time! Big thank you to Terry Lynn Guncher for your generous support. I'm so happy you're enjoying the longer videos. If you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. The First Robot Ancient Egyptians invented the first robot 4,000 years ago. These robots weren't endowed with artificial intelligence, obviously. 
The robots couldn't tell you what the weather was or the score of any ancient games, and there wasn't much they could do. But they were the first robots, and that makes them special. They were what you might call automatons, the first mechanical operating system designed to mimic human behavior. One of these forgotten robots was discovered at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. A wooden statue was given to the museum years ago and stashed in a box. But only recently did researchers come across it and become fascinated. They used x-rays to look inside the wooden statue, and then they were shocked to find a mechanical operating system inside it. The mechanism worked a lot like a pulley on an axis. When the rope is pulled, the interior mechanism moves the arms of the statue. It's an extremely simple concept, certainly not a breakthrough in robotics. But since it was built so long ago, it's pretty impressive. Historic texts from around 1100 BC also report that there were moving statues that used mechanical technology. Sadly, none of these more complex automatons have ever been recovered. The Architecture of Venice The beautiful and ancient Italian city of Venice recently found its canals dry. As the weather changes, Venice finds itself either flooding or not having enough water to move tourists through its romantic canals. It makes you wonder how Venice was even built in the first place. The original construction of Venice was an engineering masterpiece. 2,000 years ago, there was nothing here. The Venetian lagoon was nothing but a swamp with dozens of tiny islands barely sticking out of the water. And then came the Romans, who turned the swamp into an immortal city. Most people assume the Romans, starting around the 5th century AD, built Venice on these small islands and the lagoon. The truth is that they built Venice on wooden stakes that were driven into the ground. Imagine thousands of huge wooden stakes pounded into the muck, and then foundations being built on those. In other words, Venice is on stilts. Each stilt is between 13 and 26 feet long, with heavy platforms laid out over them. And yes, these foundations are still under Venice. The core structure of the city hasn't changed in 1,500 years. There have been renovations here and there, but the glorious city is still essentially hovering above a swamp, the Yakchal. 2,400 years ago, Persian engineers figured out how to keep their beer cold. Well, probably not beer, but they did figure out how to create a refrigerator that didn't require electricity. They came up with the idea for something called a Yakchal, a small structure that could be used to keep ice solid even in the hottest months of the summer. During the winter, workers would go high up in the icy mountains of Iran and carve out chunks of solid ice. That ice was then brought back to villages throughout Persia and stored in a yakchal. Even as the seasons changed and the brutal heat of the Persian summer became a thing to be reckoned with, the ice remained cold. So what did Persians use all this ice for? Researchers say it was likely for the creation of chilly summer treats, the ancient version of ice cream cones. On a hot day, you could purchase something called falude, a frozen dessert. Remember, this is 2,400 years ago. Now, let's take a look at the structure itself. I mean, how are they able to do this? The Persians built a mud brick dome about 60 feet tall. They also carved a small amount of earth from underneath, creating a semi-subterranean space at the bottom. The dome was connected to a series of wind catchers, which were designed for catching the wind. Cold winds that came down from the mountains were caught in these open corridors, then pushed inside the yakchal to keep the internal temperature cold enough not to melt the ice. It was a refrigerator powered entirely by concentrated wind. Have you ever come up with your own invention? Tell me about it in the comments! The Temple of the Sun the Temple of the Sun in Peru is one of the most unbelievable architectural achievements of any early South American civilization. The temple can be found in the rediscovered city of Machu Picchu, built by the mighty Inca Empire. The temple was constructed at the highest point inside the city. It was placed at the greatest altitude, over 7,000 feet above sea level, so the ancient astronomers could get a better look at the heavens. The Inca very much believed that the closer their city was to the sun, the more fortuitous their civilization would be. And since the Inca were such brilliant astronomers, it was only natural they put their sun temple at the highest point. 
It was within the Temple of the Sun where all the biggest events in Machu Picchu were held. Everything from sacred rituals to human sacrifices would be carried out inside the immaculately constructed stone walls. With the killer view of the deep valleys beyond the city and the sun blazing overhead, it would have been something truly incredible to see at its prime. It's believed the construction of the temple began around 1400 AD. It was impressive that they could carry so much stone to the top of the mountain and build a monumental temple and observatory. But they also incorporated modern amenities into the structure. The temple was connected to a drainage and sewage system, which carried waste away from Machu Picchu and kept the streets clean. The Hypocaust System Wealthy Romans had indoor heating long before anybody else. The richest people in the Roman Empire often had a hypocaust system installed in their homes. It was a way for them to have underfloor heating and heated walls. Ancient Romans who could afford such a system were able to stay warm and comfortable on the coldest winter night without worrying about a fireplace. Not to mention, who do you know that has heated walls for ultimate comfort in the winter? Nobody but the Romans. The hypocaust system required two things to work. First, a furnace for heating the air. Second, the floor to be raised off the ground by short pillars. What this did was allow hot air heated by the furnace to circulate underneath the floor since it was suspended. There would be a huge pocket of warm air underneath the floor, which warmed the surface and made Roman toast toasty. The walls were in a similar situation and tiled. If you press your hands against the wall of a bedroom, you could feel the heat on the tiles. The Romans even used ceramic to help better maintain the heat and keep it from escaping out the roof quicker. But you might be wondering how the Romans didn't suffocate from carbon monoxide poisoning because of the roaring furnace. The truth is that indoor heating was dangerous. A leaky floor could prove deadly. If there was so much as a crack in the tile flooring, smoke could seep through the bottom, fill the house, then kill everyone inside. But like I said before, this was only for the wealthiest Romans. The only way to keep the indoor heat going was a team of servants constantly stocking the furnace with wood and keeping an eye on the place. Chariot Technology A very rare wooden axle from a chariot was recently discovered in Suffolk, England. The wooden axle is from the Iron Age, radiocarbon dated back to about 400 BC. The axle is 2,400 years old found by Cotswold Archaeology in the lead-up to a new construction project in the area. The research team also found prehistoric pits that may have been used as watering holes for farm animals. The axle may seem pretty boring, but it is truly an ingenious piece of technology. The axle was just as important to Britons in the Iron Age as the engine is today. The chariot was how people moved around and how goods could be brought faster from one place to another. The invention of the axle was even more important than the invention of the wheel, because without both of them, humans never would have figured out how to build vehicles. The design of the wooden axle was so genius that the technology has barely changed. Research associate Michael Bamforth from the University of York was given the duty of analyzing the artifact. He learned that the component was broken and burned thousands of years ago, perhaps in an early vehicular accident. Then the axle was repurposed. Because it was found in one of the watering holes, Michael thinks it could have been repurposed as a stake to prevent the watering hole from collapsing. Not only were prehistoric Britons smart, but they were also handy. The Marib Dam One of the greatest architectural wonders of the ancient world was the Great Dam of Marib. It was arguably the most impressive engineering wonder of ancient history. The dam allowed the desert of Yemen near the ancient city of Marib to flourish. The ancient Sabaeans turned the desert into a blossoming oasis. Roughly 100 square miles of sandy soil turned into fertile dirt, allowing civilization to prosper. The dam was so important to the locals that when it collapsed in the 6th century AD, so too did the whole civilization. The once proud city of Marib found itself in shambles. Nobody could eat, there were no crops, and famine spread like a disease. The destruction of the dam was such a critical moment in history that it's even talked about in the Quran. Nobody knows exactly how big the dam was. 
That being said, scientists have estimated its wall stood 45 feet tall, and it stretched for over 1,500 feet. It was made from nothing but stone and mortar, and cut across a huge ravine, thereby altering the flow of water. Even more impressive is that the first stones were likely placed around 1700 BC, almost 4,000 years ago. But once it collapsed around 570 AD, society collapsed with it. The desert returned to being a sandy wasteland. Water Clocks The Egyptians came up with the idea of the sundial about 3,500 years ago to keep track of time. Babylonians later invented the incense clock. Archimedes came up with the astronomical clock, and mechanical clocks appeared in Europe in the 1300s. But one of the oldest methods of all was the water clock, likely invented in Babylon around the 16th century BC. The Egyptians, Babylonians, and Greeks would all come to accept water clocks as accurate ways of telling the time. Up until the invention of the pendulum clock in 1656, Water clocks were still seen as some of the most accurate time-keeping devices in the world. The oldest such clock dates back to 1417 BC. It was discovered in the Temple of Amun-Re at Karnak. The clock was a fairly simple mechanism. Imagine taking a bottle of water and poking a very tiny hole in the bottom. Then you mark the inside of the bottle to measure the passage of time. The water will drain from the bottle at the exact same rate and as the water level falls, it's easy to see the markings inside, aka the passage of time. This was the basis for the water clock at the Temple of Amun-Re, except the Egyptian one was huge and made of stone and marked with 12 columns to measure the passage of hours. As water seeped from the vessel, time passed consistently. Priests at the temple used the water clock so that they could perform sacrifices and other ceremonies at the correct time. It was necessary for nighttime ceremonies, since there was no sun telling them what time it was. Maya Superhighways Long before Americans started paving North America in long sheets of asphalt, the Maya had a network of superhighways of their own. Scientists have recently conducted laser mapping of the Guatemalan jungle and discovered never-before-seen remnants of the Maya civilization. They discovered vestiges of the Maya people dating back 2,000 years. And while most news outlets are talking about the temples, hidden pyramids, and lost cities, the scientists found something even more impressive. They found over 964 settlements interconnected by miles of highway. The lead author of the study, Richard Hansen from Idaho State University, believes the team identified the world's first superhighway system. For example, they identified a chunk of raised stone trails, a kind of paved footpath through the otherwise dense and impassable jungle. The footpath stretches a whopping 110 miles. This one only linked a handful of communities, but it's a great example of how serious the Maya were about keeping their kingdom connected. Scientists say these superhighways are evidence that the Maya civilization was far more advanced than anyone previously thought. This was a complex society who used a system of roads like a spider web, connecting ceremonial sites, cities, and agricultural settlements. The Mummy's Tooth Archaeologists have solved the mystery of Queen Hatshepsut's mummy, all thanks to a missing tooth. Hatshepsut, who ruled Egypt as one of the greatest women pharaohs of all time over 3,000 years ago, was the daughter of Tuthmosis I. She married her half-brother, Tuthmosis II, which was pretty common in ancient Egypt. Then, when her brother or husband died, she took the throne for herself. She was the second woman to have assumed the Egyptian throne, ruling between 1473 and 1458 BC. This was at the peak of Egyptian culture, when they were positively thriving as a society. But unfortunately, Egyptian society wasn't quite as advanced as we like to think. After she died, her successor, Tutmosis III, tried to erase her from history. He didn't want a female in the history books as ruler of Egypt. He tore down her statues, defaced her monuments, and tried to scratch her name out of the official records. And while this was going on, her mummy vanished. It's been a puzzle that modern archaeologists have been trying to put together for decades. The tomb of Hatshepsut was discovered in 1902 by British archaeologist Howard Carter. 
but her sarcophagus was empty. The next year, Carter discovered tomb KV-60, which had two mummified women lying next to each other in decayed coffins. But because the tomb wasn't a royal one, no one paid much attention. It wasn't until recently that famous archaeologist Zahi Hawass investigated the mysterious mummy found in KV-60. He used new CT technology to scan the mummy and get more information about her. The scans revealed that she was obese, somewhere between 45 and 60, and had terrible teeth. She also suffered from cancer. The Egyptologist then took a tooth known to belong to Hatshepsut because it was in her official tomb in a wooden box. He was able to match that tooth to the mummy, confirming her as Hatshepsut. We now know the queen was taken out of her original tomb and dumped in a nameless hole in the ground. It was all because the king who came after her wanted to erase Hatshepsut from history. Smudges and Bloodstains One of the greatest artifacts being kept at the government archive in Sibiu, Romania, is a letter written on August 4, 1475. It was written by a man who described himself as a prince, and its contents are quite simple. The man wanted to inform the townspeople that he would be taking up residence with them. The signature on the bottom of the letter is Vlad Dracula. Vlad Dracula, also known as Vlad Tepes and more famously as Vlad the Impaler, was not a popular man. In the 15th century, he ruled the region of Wallachia and was known for his cruelty. In 1475, he was preparing to take the throne once again. The letter he wrote to the residents was to prepare them for his coming. At least he gave them a warning. Scientists in Romania recently embarked on a mission to see how much information they could gain from historical texts and artifacts, not just using X-rays and CT scans, but by genetic sequencing. A team of experts took the letter written by Dracula and scoured it for molecule fragments of his sweat, saliva, and tears. They were hoping to find out if Dracula truly did cry blood tears. That's one of the myths surrounding the long-dead ruler. If they were able to find tear smudges or blood stains, they believed they could determine if Dracula suffered from something called hemolacria. Unfortunately, the test proved inconclusive, but the technology is there to see into the biology of ancient rulers. Scientists can now take artifacts, look for blood stains or other biological matter, and then find out more about the ancient people who handled the artifacts. Ancient Artifacts in Australia Human history in Australia stretches back about 65,000 years. Because most ancient societies built their cities on the coastlines where they had easy access to fish, many of those societies are currently under the water. Over the past 65,000 years, the coastline of Australia has slowly been submerged. This is especially true following the end of the Ice Age 12,000 years ago, when water levels across the globe rose. An estimated one-third of Australia's land was covered in water. This has made discovering lost Australian settlements a huge chore for archaeologists. But it's not impossible. Jonathan Benjamin and his team of researchers from Flinders University in Adelaide used sonar-equipped boats to scan the sea around the Dambier Archipelago in search of lost societies. Sonar revealed specific places on the seabed where there could be evidence of prehistoric humans. Then, when divers went down to check, they made a shocking discovery. Divers uncovered over 269 stone artifacts buried under 8 feet of water. The artifacts are about 7,000 years old and include primitive instruments. Even more shocking is that just up the coastline, the same archaeologists identified a different site 8,500 years old. That one is underneath 45 feet of water. Ancient Pictish Settlement Burghead Fort on the coast of Scotland was once the largest fortification ever built by the ancient Pictish people over 1,000 years ago. The fort was occupied starting around the year 500, and within a few centuries had grown to be three times the size of any other site in early medieval Scotland. It was almost certainly the center of power for the Pictish kingdom of Fortriu, which flourished up until the 9th century. It was in the 10th century that the fortress was burned to the ground, likely by Vikings during a coastal raid. Up until recently, archaeologists believed the remains of the fort were lost, destroyed during the construction of the 19th century town built over it. 
But now, a team of researchers from the University of Aberdeen have managed to create an incredible 3D reconstruction of what Burghead Fort once looked like. They used modern technology and the remains of broken tower walls and ramparts for their 3D reconstruction. When all was said and done, the team created amazing images of what the city looked like. It was truly a massive fortification, with three tall walls, heavy medieval gates, a chapel at the entrance to bless visitors, and a small settlement in the back where the citizens lived. Big shout out to Rogan McFall and Alicia Geist. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. Biblical Magnetism Scientists are currently trying to use magnetic technology to prove biblical stories as fact rather than fiction. Studying the Bible has always been difficult because the texts are so ancient. They've been edited so many times, and the archaeological evidence is hard to come by. But Yoav Vaknin from Tel Aviv University believes a new technology can help solve some of the Bible's greatest mysteries. This method is called archaeomagnetic dating, and it involves examining the layer of liquid iron in the outer core of the planet. Because archaeological material contains small magnetic minerals, looking at these minerals on an atomic level can reveal a magnetic signal that correlates to a specific period in time. In other words, if scientists know the magnetic state of the planet at the time something was destroyed, like say a brick home and a fire in ancient Israel, they can match the magnetic particles to that specific time. To put things as simply as possible, it's like carbon dating except using magnetism. So far, this method has been used to confirm some biblical stories and debunk others. Tel Beth Sheehan was once believed to have been destroyed by the Aramean king Hazael in 830 BC. But by using this new form of magnetic investigation, researchers saw that the destruction was 100 years earlier. That means the city was destroyed by Pharaoh Shoshank I instead, which matches the story in the Hebrew Bible. It also matches details left carved into the wall of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. Angkor Revealed It was in 1858 that French explorer Henri Mohat departed London and journeyed to the exotic jungles of Cambodia. He died during his travels, taken down by a fever in Laos when he was only 35 years old. The reason we still know his name is that he discovered the lost medieval city of Angkor, still one of the most impressive places anywhere on Earth. Henri wrote in his journal that the temple of Angkor Wat was grander than anything left by the Greeks or the Romans. His description wasn't far from the truth. We now know that Angkor Wat was constructed around the year 1150. After almost a thousand years, it is still the biggest religious complex known to humanity. It covers an area roughly four times greater than Vatican City. Discoveries are still being made in the jungles of Cambodia to this day. It was just recently that archaeologists used new technology to find an even older city hidden in the trees beyond Angkor. A team from the University of Sydney mapped a huge area of jungle using remote sensing technology. They mounted a device to the helicopter, then flew it around the jungle as it blasted laser beams through the canopy. This method revealed highways, temples, and entire cities strewn across the landscape. All of this would otherwise be completely invisible because of the thick jungle foliage. We don't know much about these lost cities, only that they likely predate the Khmer Empire, who built Angkor. New Discoveries of King Tut's Tomb A lot of amazing relics were discovered in 1922 when Howard Carter opened the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun. One of the most fabulous was a mysterious dagger and its golden sheath. The blade was made of solid iron, which didn't make sense. Egyptians didn't learn how to smelt iron until many hundreds of years after Tutankhamun was dead. Carter believed the dagger was imported from Anatolia, where the Hittite Empire had an early iron industry. It wouldn't be until 2016 that scientists were able to analyze the properties of the iron understanding that it didn't come from the Hittite Empire. It came from outer space. Researchers were able to determine that the mysterious dagger contained high levels of nickel. So much nickel is typically associated with meteoric iron, meaning iron from a meteorite. It appears that the Egyptians got a hold of a space rock 
then use the raw iron to forge a dagger for the young boy Pharaoh. It must have been for him a gift from the gods. Ancient Gold Traders In 1873, international entrepreneur Heinrich Schliemann came across a small treasure trove of gold and silver, which he called King Priam's treasure. He believed the treasure came from the lost city of Troy and belonged to the king of the city in the 13th century. However, much more recent advancements in technology have revealed the treasure to be significantly older. A mobile handheld laser helped date the jewelry to between 2500 and 2000 BC. More than that, the laser revealed an ancient gold trading route spanning from Turkey to the Indus Valley. The treasure was originally discovered at the ancient settlement of Polyokni, about 37 miles from the city of Troy. The bits of gold and silver are stored at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Researchers used what is called an innovative mobile laser to melt 120 microns of the gold. That's a little more than the width of a piece of hair. The samples of gold burned away by the laser were then sent for mass spectrometry. Scientists studied their chemical composition, identifying high levels of tin, platinum, and palladium. This means the gold was washed out of a river in the form of dust. This is really fascinating because scientists were then able to link the gold to other artifacts found in the royal tombs of Ur in modern Iraq. They continue to match gold artifacts all over the world, including ones found in Egypt, Bulgaria, the Eurasian steppes, and Georgia. It's now pretty clear that there was a vast trading network with gold moving across the known world over 4,500 years ago. The Oldest Cooking Fire New artificial intelligence technology recently helped researchers uncover what they say might be the oldest cooking fire in the world. The fire is about 1 million years old, located in Israel. Felipe Natalio from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Tel Aviv is the one behind the creation of the new technology. He wanted to develop a way to detect changes in atomic composition left behind by fires from a very long time ago. He and his colleagues then developed the AI program to use ultraviolet light to detect very subtle patterns. They used the program on 26 flint tools uncovered at the Evron Quarry in Israel, dating the site to between 800,000 and 1 million years old. The AI program was able to identify sediment on the tools from a fire. We don't know if it was a human-made fire or if the fire just so happened to be there. However, Natalio believes it was a cooking site, making it one of the oldest in the world. We don't know what they were cooking, but whoever was here may have been one of the first chefs in human history. The Robot Explorer Ocean 1K is the newest advancement in underwater archaeology. It is an underwater robot designed by researchers from Stanford University. The robot's purpose is to dive deep beneath the surface of the ocean where ordinary human divers can't go. The robot will be used in the near future to search for sunken planes, explore shipwrecks at the bottom of the sea, and retrieve artifacts from lost cities. The humanoid robot just reached a milestone of diving half a mile under the surface, something no human has ever done. This really is the next level in robotics. Sure, the Ocean 1K can be manipulated by the operator to pick up artifacts and bring them to the surface, but that's not all. The robot has a touch-based feedback system. The diver can feel everything the robot is feeling, from the rusty hull of a sunken ship to the smooth glass of a Roman oil lamp. Ocean 1K has yet to make any notable discoveries, but its mission has only just begun. Keep an eye out because this robot will hopefully make some shocking finds in the next few years, and I'll be sure to keep you posted. The Alien Night of Notre Dame in 2019, fire broke out at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, ravaging the 850-year-old structure. But what started as a tragedy yielded unexpected results. When experts began preparing the site for restoration, they came across a pair of ancient sarcophagi. The contents of the ancient coffins were shocking. Archaeologists from the National Institute of Preventive Archaeological Research said one of the coffins contained the body of a knight. Only this wasn't any ordinary knight. He had worn pelvic bones, suggesting he rode his horse a lot. But he also had an elongated head, 
that would have made him look like an alien while alive. This bizarre discovery is changing the way we look at Notre Dame, and indeed the medieval era. The knight who was buried here went by the nickname Le Cavalier, as was detailed on his sarcophagus. But we don't know what his real name was. Researchers say he was likely intentionally deformed as an infant. Whoever raised the child forced him to wear a special headdress which crushed his skull, shaping it unnaturally as he grew. Then, at around 30 years old, the knight died. He didn't die violently in battle, but most likely passed on because of a chronic disease that caused him to lose all of his teeth. He would have been buried under Notre Dame near the end of the 16th century. It's a confounding discovery because nobody knew there were knights with deformed, alien-like heads roaming around France during that time. It's opened a door of mystery that scientists are desperate to solve. Are you surprised to hear there was cranial deformation in France in the medieval days? Let me know in the comments! Secrets of Hieroglyphic Writing One of the greatest discoveries archaeologists ever made was how to read hieroglyphic writing. It was a major revolution in the scientific community, changing our ability to understand ancient history. It all started in 1814, when British scientist Thomas Young started studying the Rosetta Stone. You know, that stone that was discovered by Napoleon in 1799. The Rosetta Stone changed the world. The Rosetta Stone was inscribed with a message from Egyptian priests in 196 BC, with hieroglyphic script written beside Coptic and then Greek. The side-by-side -side writing allowed François Champollion to decipher the language for the first time between 1822 and 1824. This truly was a discovery that changed history, but there is a lot that people don't understand about hieroglyphic writing. For example, it wasn't just a bunch of pictures with special meanings. This is what initially confused the experts trying to figure out the language. These symbols look like pictures of people, objects, and animals, but that isn't the case. Hieroglyphics is a phonetic language in which every symbol represents a sound. It's just like how A or B represent a certain sound in the English alphabet. But with hieroglyphics, the letters are pictures. Water into wine According to the Gospel of John, Jesus Christ turned water into wine in front of a shocked audience at the wedding at Cana. But no one has ever been able to figure out where that wedding took place. All the Gospel tells us is that Jesus was invited to a wedding with his mother and his twelve disciples. That's a lot of plus ones. Then, when the wine ran out at the ceremony, Jesus showed his true power. He turned the water into wine so that everyone could continue feasting. Thank goodness, since he brought so many guests. Over the years, scholars have placed the site of Cana in half a dozen villages across Galilee, but no one has ever been able to offer reliable proof for their claim. Until now. A group of researchers believe they finally identified the Jewish village where Jesus Christ performed his first miracle. It's called Kerbet Wana, and it's long gone now. The village existed between 323 BC and 324 AD. In its crumbling ruins, experts uncovered clues that they say matched the description of Jesus and his miracle. They found a large network of underground tunnels used for worshipping Christ. They also found a veneration cave complex. This was an underground sanctuary where Christian pilgrims came to venerate the miracle of turning water into wine. The complex was used 1,500 years ago, right up until the Crusades in the 12th century. Unfortunately, there still isn't any possible way to confirm whether Jesus Christ truly performed this miracle. It's still a story written in a book. However, Kerbedwana does appear to be the most likely location for the site of Cana, the invasion of the Huns. Attila the Hun is remembered today as the terrorizer of the Roman Empire. Most historians agree that Attila and his army of Huns descended on Central Asia and Eastern Europe with fury and violence. It started at the beginning of the 5th century AD. Attila, known commonly as the Scourge of God, rallied his people and they galloped towards the Roman Empire, burning down everything in their way. This isn't up for debate. We know the Huns ravaged Europe and helped destabilize the Roman Empire. But what scientists have never been able to understand is why Attila embarked upon such a campaign of violence. Scientists now believe they may have found the answer. 
If they prove to be right, it's going to change how we view Attila and his barbarian army. Researchers from the University of Cambridge studied tree rings in Europe to see what the climate was like 2,000 years ago. Their research showed that drought likely devastated the Huns' homeland. The Huns suddenly ran out of food, causing them to lash out and overrun their neighbors. Suddenly, without rain and with no crops to eat, Attila led his people on a conquest into the territory of the Goth tribes. After fighting through Germany and Austria, the Huns attacked Rome. What this discovery changes is the motivation behind the brutality. We can't look at Attila the Hun as a bloodthirsty warmonger any longer. He was just a leader of men trying to save his starving people by any means necessary. Do you agree with this theory? Let me know in the comments! Big shout out to Tyson Gerard and Alex Swan. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. We'd love to have you! The Early Humans of Ethiopia When human beings, meaning Homo sapiens, began spreading out from Africa, they were adapted to living in the lowlands. We were terrestrial animals that lived at low altitudes, in plains and fields and forests. For an animal living at a low altitude to suddenly climb up into the mountains is a huge transition. Higher altitudes are often drier, oxygen isn't readily available, and the change can shock the system. For this reason, scientists long held the theory that the high plateaus of Tibet and the vast mountains of Ethiopia were not places humans originally settled. But a new discovery has changed history. Researchers uncovered a rock shelter in the Bale Mountains of Ethiopia that was home to a group of humans 47,000 years ago. Back then, the mountains were still covered completely in glaciers and ice. Scientists don't fully understand why primitive Homo sapiens climbed up the icy slopes and made their homes here. Experts sifted through the burned bones found inside the rock shelter. This allowed them to see the diet of the ancient high-altitude humans. They lived in the chilly cavern and survived mainly from eating African mole rats. These are huge rodents like gigantic rats with incisors so big you can use them as tent pegs. Gotts Ossendorf from the University of Cologne says it was the rats that helped make life at altitude possible. They were easy to catch, they gave significant nutritional value, and so humans were able to slowly get used to living in the mountains. Would you eat a giant rat to survive? Why not? Let me know. Ancient Tattoos The truth behind tattoos is that people have been inking their bodies for a long, long time. Tattoos may be controversial today, and certainly more so in previous decades, but this taboo is a new phenomenon. The truth is that tattooing was popular all over the ancient world. Japan, Egypt, New Zealand, Thrace, North America, Scotland, everyone had tattoos. The oldest preserved tattoos ever found were on the cold flesh of Otzi the Iceman. He died 5,300 years ago in the mountains of Italy, then was uncovered practically frozen in a block of ice in 1991. His body was marked with primitive tattoos. In 2019, researchers found tattoo needles in southeastern Utah from 2,000 years ago. Native Americans used cactus spines and yucca leaves to tattoo their friends. Tattoo historian Steve Gilbert says the word tattoo comes from the Samoan language, from ancient Polynesian explorers who themselves were covered in tattoos. Thanks to discoveries like these, we know humans used tattooing as a sign of expression for at least 5,300 years. Many ancient Egyptian mummies were also found covered in tattoos, showing it was socially accepted then as well. So, what happened to make tattoos controversial in Western cultures? Researchers say it happened in the 1400s. European colonizers were not nearly as interested in tattoos as many of the people they were colonizing. Europeans then used tattoos as a way to draw a line between the sophisticated European people and those they saw as uncivilized. What do you think about tattoos? Do you have any? Let me know in the comments! Spanish Jewels In 1656, a ship sank while sailing from Havana to Spain with a preposterous amount of treasure from the Americas. The ship was named Our Lady of Wonders, and it belonged to the King of Spain. 
It was a Spanish galleon and part of a larger fleet sailing through the Bahamas with a cargo of gold, silver, and priceless gems. The entirety of the treasure was going to be dumped on the lap of King Philip IV. But sadly for the greedy king, the ship never arrived. It ran into another ship in the fleet and sank, killing an estimated 605 people. The treasure sank to the bottom of the ocean. The exact location of the wreck was never really lost. It's been salvaged already by countless expeditions. But a new group led by marine archaeologists with Allen Exploration went in search of the treasure themselves. They found priceless Spanish jewels scattered across the floor of the ocean. They retrieved a six-foot-long gold chain and even found a gold pendant with the cross of Santiago on it, framed in a dozen green emeralds. There were so many treasures that if they sold them on the black market, the entire crew could retire. The real wonder is that there is any treasure left. Allen Exploration founder Carl Allen says the galleon was already salvaged by Spanish, French, Dutch, and English expeditions in the 17th and 18th centuries. It was also pillaged by greedy treasure hunters in the 1990s. It's a miracle the archaeologists found any treasure at all. The Dead Sea Scrolls In 1946 or 47, nobody's exactly sure on the date, a group of teenagers herding goats near the ancient settlement of Qumran made a discovery that changed history. On the shore of the Dead Sea, one of the shepherds threw a rock into a cave on the side of a cliff. Then came the sharp sound of clay shattering. The youngsters climbed into the cavern and found a huge assortment of clay jars, most of which contained leather or papyrus scrolls. This was the beginning of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Over the next few years, treasure hunters and archaeologists descended on Israel like a plague. Tens of thousands of scroll fragments were taken from an estimated 10 nearby caves, in total completing over 900 lost religious manuscripts. Many of these manuscripts were written 2,000 years ago. This was shocking because up until the discovery, the oldest manuscripts from the Hebrew Bible came from the 10th century. Yet the Dead Sea Scrolls included 225 biblical books from 1,200 years earlier. It's difficult to put into words how significant this discovery was. Nearly the entirety of the Hebrew Bible was found represented in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They also included a guide to hidden treasure and forbidden biblical texts. For example, the story of Enoch and the Nephilim who once walked the earth. The Tomb of Salome Researchers have discovered some interesting things at the Tomb of Salome, the alleged burial site of a woman who helped during the birth of Jesus Christ. The tomb was first discovered by grave robbers west of Jerusalem in the 1980s. It was one of the only times illegal looters made a discovery that would change history. Later excavations revealed the Jewish burial chamber dating back to the days of Rome. The burial chamber was then converted into a Christian chapel and continued to draw worshippers even in the early days of the Islamic period. But then the tomb was lost. An inscription found inside the tomb led researchers to believe it was dedicated to Salome. She played the role as midwife at the birth of Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of James. But the only evidence of this being her tomb came in the form of some inscriptions mentioning her name. Researchers say it was the cult of Salome who sanctified the site in her honor sometime in the 5th century. The most recent discovery is not at all what you might expect. Researchers found the remains of shops near the tomb that were selling clay lamps. These shops targeted pilgrims who were coming from across the world to see the tomb of Jesus' midwife. These shops operated as late as the 9th century, making huge money off visiting tourists. It really makes you wonder if the tomb really belonged to Salome or if it was just a trick to sell tourist clay lamps. This could have been an ancient tourist trap. Ships in the Sea Since 2015, researchers with the Maritime Archaeological Project have been searching for shipwrecks in the Black Sea. They have uncovered no less than 60 wrecks spanning a whopping 2,500 years of naval history. These ships date back to the medieval, Byzantine, Roman, and Greek periods. And according to historians, they are rewriting everything we know about ancient trade and shipbuilding. 
The team had originally set out to map the floor of the Black Sea off the coast of Bulgaria. They weren't initially looking for ships, but were more interested in things like the fluctuations in sea level. The discovery of ships was more accidental than anything. In just one year, they had already found 44 ancient vessels. There are so many lost shipwrecks down here that scientists will need a lifetime to study them all. John Adams from the University of Southampton says the collection of Black Sea shipwrecks must comprise one of the greatest underwater museums in the world. Who wants to go diving? But researchers didn't just find ships. They also uncovered a lost village from the Bronze Age submerged by 13 feet of water. There is an untapped archaeological treasure at the bottom of the Black Sea that scientists haven't even scratched the surface of. Gold Mummies Archaeologists in Egypt recently discovered two gold-wrapped mummies, which they believe could help find the mysterious resting place of Queen Cleopatra. The discovery was made in the ancient port city of Taposiris Magna, located just a few miles along the coast from Alexandria. Within this city, there is a burial ground that was used for Egyptian royalty during the Greek Hellenistic period. That was when Cleopatra reigned as the last official pharaoh of ancient Egypt. The big mystery surrounding the fabled Queen of Egypt is that no one has ever been able to locate her resting place. Nobody knows where her tomb is. Archaeologists are worried that her tomb was swept away during a tsunami in the year 365 AD. Alexandria was hit by a major natural disaster, and it submerged about half the city underwater. There is a pretty good possibility that Cleopatra's tomb was washed away and destroyed, and her remains are long gone. However, that may not be the case. The golden-wrapped mummies found in the temple of Taposiris Magna prove there was a favorite location for burying royalty outside Alexandria. It could be that Cleopatra wasn't buried in the grand city named after Alexander the Great, but down the coastline. The issue is that although the burial chamber had been undisturbed for 2,000 years, the mummies are in a poor state of preservation because water seeped through. But crucial evidence reveals they were originally covered with gold leaf from head to toe, a luxury afforded only to those from the top tiers of society. Archaeologists suggest perhaps these two individuals had interacted with Cleopatra herself, and maybe they can lead researchers to her final resting place. Noah's Ark The physical remains of Noah's Ark may have been found almost 150 years ago. The very ark that Noah used to save humanity and two of each animal could be a real thing, and that would change history as we know it. Noah's Ark was considered irrefutable science up until the end of the 1700s. Just like most biblical stories, the Ark was a real historical fact rather than something made up in a book. According to the Bible, when the great rains stopped and the water began to recede into the oceans, Noah docked his boat at Mount Ararat in Turkey. Once there, he opened the doors of his ship and let all the animals out to spread across the new world and repopulate. And so, a research team journeyed to the mountain to see if they could find real archaeological traces of the boat. Mount Ararat is a very interesting place. It stands over 16,000 feet tall and is about 22 miles at its base. It was considered sacred and unclimbable for centuries. The Armenians wouldn't even allow any human to approach it. The first recorded expedition didn't take place until 1829 because of superstition. In 1876, James Bryce tried to climb the mountain. He was an explorer and historian, but not the best mountaineer. He couldn't reach the peak, but he did discover a wooden beam high up in the snow that didn't look like it belonged there. The beam looked like it came from a ship, but it was so big that James couldn't bring it down. He returned to England with news of his discovery, but the beam was never seen again. Humans and Dinosaurs In Kuwait, a shepherd was looking for one of his animals when he accidentally stumbled upon an archaeological marvel. The man came to the entrance of a cavern, at which point he found prehistoric art scribbled on the wall. The shepherd had found himself some cave art, and he didn't think too much of it. That was until he realized the artwork showed humans with dinosaurs. 
Some believe the mysterious cave art in Kuwait proves that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. If true, such a discovery would utterly smash just about every scientific theory on the natural history of the planet. Abdul Al Shalafi is the paleontologist in charge of the site. He thought the images were just modern graffiti until he did carbon dating analysis and discovered that the drawings are real and very, very old. Not only that, but the images of dinosaurs appear to be older than the images of the people and the other animals, suggesting someone had drawn the dinosaurs many years earlier. Al Shalafi went on to say the pictograms could represent real evidence of humans hunting dinosaurs. He even suggested humans might be responsible for the extinction of dinosaurs by hunting them for millions of years. It's a difficult perspective and one that goes against almost every piece of science that we have. But if true, it would change everything. Big shout out to Lebo, Shirley, and Jennifer Joey. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. We've got lots more videos like these coming up. The Map of the Underworld Archaeologists have found a coffin in Egypt that holds the oldest known map of the underworld. The coffin appears to have been used to hold the body of an unknown elite female called Ankh. Inside the coffin, the earliest known copy of what's called the Book of Two Ways, dating back about 4,000 years, was found. The Book of Two Ways was kind of a big deal in ancient Egypt. It was a simple text which describes the two ways a soul could reach the afterlife, meaning the Egyptian underworld. The Egyptians really thought they understood how to reach the underworld. They thought the departed person could follow the map in their coffin to reach their final destination. The issue with reaching the underworld was that it was extremely difficult. The paths were considered treacherous, some led to nowhere, and there was even a lake of fire involved that could destroy the person's soul. The Book of Two Ways wasn't a map in the traditional sense, but more like a map of the soul. It contained advice on how to get past the demons and guardians blocking the way to eternal peace. But of course, it also detailed specific areas the deceased would encounter, such as the abode of the knife wielders, the gates of fire and darkness, the snake charmers, the path of confusions, and so much more. Santa's Tomb If you've ever wanted proof that Santa Claus is real, get ready to have your mind blown. A team of archaeologists in Turkey have finally discovered the very real tomb of Santa Claus. It was found underneath the floor at the St. Nicholas Church in Demre, previously unknown because it was hidden underneath an intricate mosaic. This came as a major revelation because up until now, nobody had known where jolly old St. Nick had been hiding. Historical records showed that he was buried at the same church that bears his name, but searches of the grounds over the centuries never turned up a body. Other rumors had been swirling that Italian merchants stole his body and sold it during the Middle Ages. There was an empty grave in the church that had clearly been looted, and the body of a man believed to be St. Nicholas was laid to rest in Italy during the Crusades. But in the end, he was entombed beneath the floor of his very own church for the past 1,600 years, exactly where he was supposed to be. As for just who this Santa Claus was, he was a real man who lived between 270 and 343 AD. He was known for giving gifts to the poor, so benevolent he became a saint and later the inspiration for the Santa Claus character. The Treasure of El Carambolo the treasure of El Carambolo was discovered in the 1950s by workers in El Carambolo, Spain. The workers discovered 21 giant pieces of gold work dating back 2,700 years. The gold artifacts were so exquisite, so well crafted and so strikingly beautiful, it was assumed they came from a highly advanced civilization. Many believed the gold was a lost treasure from the city of Atlantis. Recently, researchers from the Archaeological Museum of Sevilla confirmed the treasure was made locally. The gold came from Spanish mines, meaning it couldn't have possibly come from an outside civilization. Instead, it was likely the product of the Tarteso civilization that flourished in Spain between the 9th and 6th centuries BC. But that doesn't mean the gold had nothing to do with Atlantis. The Tartesians are still a major European mystery. 
They were highly advanced engineers, built marvelous pieces of architecture, and loved gold. They were ruled by a powerful king and had a complex social hierarchy. But then they vanished. About 2,500 years ago, they disappeared as if by magic. Nobody knows what happened to the Tarteso civilization. But recent excavations at sites in old Tarteso's territory show that the culture was decimated by a tsunami right around the time they lost their power. That sounds an awful lot like what happened to the Atlanteans. It could very well be that Atlantis was in Spain and that they were in fact the people of the Tartesos civilization. The Tribe of Clover Hollow The oldest civilization in the world might have once lived in the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains are some of the oldest in the world. They were born 325 million years ago when Africa bumped against North America. It was such a dramatic crash that the mountains were dramatically pushed up from sea level to incredibly high elevations. Most scientists agree they had once reached elevations higher than almost any other mountain range in the world, except maybe the Himalayas. When the first pioneers began roaming through the Appalachian wilderness, they came across strange evidence of ancient human beings. As far as the pioneers were concerned, they were the first humans to ever live on that land. And yet they kept coming across petroglyphs and mysterious stone alignments. These oddities seem to be concentrated around Clover Hollow Mountain. Two particularly strange stone alignments can be seen at Sinking Creek. On either side of the creek, you can find a stone outcrop that looks like a piece from a gatepost. These pieces of stone look like they were carved by human hands and almost seem to have facial features. Some experts have suggested these were once part of a great gate that stretched across the creek as a kind of entrance into a city in the hills. Unfortunately, there is very little other evidence of ancient humans found. There are enough markings in the area to prove that someone had once been here, but it was so long ago that all other proof has been destroyed or already returned to nature. The Wabanzi Stone The Wabanzi Stone is a mystery currently hiding in a museum in Chicago. It's a gigantic red granite boulder with a face carved onto its surface. The face was carved with expert precision, showing a man with a light beard, his eyes squeezed shut, and his mouth wide open as if whistling or singing. But that's not even the strangest part. Above the man's head, on the top of the huge block of stone, is a bowl. It looks like a basin where you might wash your face or hands, but it can't hold water because the water drains through a hole and comes out through a spout at the bottom of the carved face. There are also two connecting holes on either side of the boulder, which may have been used to attach the boulder to a sea vessel. As you can probably imagine, this bizarre artifact has caused a lot of controversy. It was allegedly found at the mouth of a river near Lake Michigan in 1804. Nobody knows how old it is exactly, with estimates from a few centuries to over 10,000 years old. It weighs roughly 3,000 pounds, but had once been much larger. When the Chicago Museum first took possession of it, they cut a huge part of it off because they wanted to make it into a drinking fountain. We still don't know who carved the Wabanzi stone or what it was used for. Some have suggested it was an ancient standing stone in Chicago. Some say it was used by early Native Americans for horrific sacrificial purposes. And others think it was brought by a group of Phoenicians across the sea and then left following a failed colony from the Mediterranean. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Ice Age Britain The oldest human DNA ever identified in the United Kingdom is changing everything we know about Britain. Scientists have obtained the very first DNA from Paleolithic humans in the British Isles. DNA evidence taken from Gow's Cave in Somerset and from Kendrick's Cave in North Wales has revealed the true original British. Two completely different populations of humans moved into the British Isles at the end of the last Ice Age. The populations were culturally distinct. They ate different food and even buried their dead differently. The discovery was made thanks to scientists from the Natural History Museum and the University College London. The DNA came from individuals who lived over 13,500 years ago. 
It's true that prehistoric people lived on the British Isles long before the last ice age. However, these two groups represent the first modern humans to colonize the islands. The first group was a culture that spread out from Northwest Europe about 16,000 years ago. The second group also appeared from Northwest Europe 2,000 years later, but they originated in the Near East. In other words, one group started higher north, around maybe Scandinavia, and the other group started closer to Turkey. Each group then migrated in roughly a straight line towards Britain, and each group settled at a different spot on the island. What this proves is that the original inhabitants of Britain came from vastly different places and were genetically worlds apart. Tabula Cortonensis In 1992, the Tabula Cortonensis was discovered near the Italian city of Curtun, not far from the alleged tomb of the famous mathematician Pythagoras. The tablet was made 2,200 years ago and cut into eight tiny fragments. It was an instant hit with archaeologists because the text written on it proved to be a record of a land transfer between two people. It was a very old bill of sale, an agreement to transfer one piece of land to another party. It's still one of the longest examples of Etruscan writing ever found. This was a huge deal because the lengthy wording of the document allowed researchers to decode the lost language of the Etruscans the ancient people who dominated northern Italy before the Romans. Much of the language was already known, but the Tabula Cortonensis changed things. It was written in a distinctly unique dialect for the region where it was discovered. This might not sound that interesting, but it proves that even throughout the various regions in Italy, the Etruscans spoke their own specific form of the language. And now we can uncover more secrets. The Lost Ship of the Colorado Desert Hiding beneath the sand of the Colorado Desert is said to be a 17th century Spanish ship. Not only is the ship supposedly hidden somewhere in the arid landscape, but so too is its fortune of pearls and treasure. The story begins in 1870 on a cool morning in November. A man by the name of Klusker, a veteran who fought in the Mexican-American War, went looking for a Spanish ship in the southeastern corner of the state. He searched, but he didn't find anything. When he almost died from dehydration, he had no choice but to return to civilization. In the Daily Alta California, a story was published about Klusker and his search for the vessel. The story claimed that Klusker knew of its location and he would return to it with seven barrels of water to uncover the treasure. But Klusker never did find the wreckage of the Spanish galleon. In fact, nobody has. And yet there's no way to disprove Klusker's theory that in the early 17th century, a ship filled with treasure sailed up the Colorado River in search of a mythical passage between the Pacific and the Atlantic. Klusker and others with an eye for treasure believe the story could be true. The ship, hoping to find the ocean, was instead lifted on a tidal bore, carried onto a sandbank, then buried. If anyone ever does find the mysterious treasure, it could change history as we know it. Greek Giants In ancient Greek mythology, giants were described as very real beings who lived and went extinct. They were flesh and blood, just like real human beings, and they lived throughout Europe alongside prehistoric beasts. At least that was what the Greeks wrote in their stories. They believed the bones of extinct giants could be found sticking out of the ground. Most modern scientists understand these bones to be the remains of mammoths, mastodons, and woolly rhinos that once lived in the region. Others are certain the Greeks knew something we don't, and believe they had secret knowledge that giants really existed and went extinct just a few thousand years ago. There weren't very many giants, which is why their bones are few and far between. But they did exist, and the ancient cultures of the world knew about them. The really tantalizing thing about the giant theory is that it's impossible to disprove. No scientist on Earth can say irrefutably that giants never existed, but there also isn't much evidence to corroborate the myths told by the Greeks and other ancient civilizations. Yet there have been some weird discoveries involving huge bones. Take the giant skeleton of Morocco. The people of Tingis claimed their founder was a giant who went by the name Antaeus. When the Romans invaded, they didn't believe the outrageous story of a giant founder. Roman soldiers dug into his grave mound in 81 BC, 
and were shocked to find an enormous skeleton there. They were so impressed that they reburied Antaeus' remains, and nobody has seen his bones since. Modern scientists say it was most likely just elephant bones the Romans found. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Cyrus Cylinder A shocking archaeological discovery made in the land of Babylon has shed light on a story from the Bible. This appears to be the newest piece of archaeological evidence confirming yet another tale from the Bible as historical fact. The discovery is of an artifact called the Cyrus Cylinder, named after Persian ruler Cyrus the Great. According to Tom Meyer from Shasta Bible College in California, the object represents a clear and obvious link to scripture from the Book of Ezra. The cylinder was buried under the sands of Babylon for 2,500 years, then discovered by English archaeologists in the modern age. The artifact is only a few inches long, but it's what was written on the cylinder that makes it so important. The cylinder records a decree given by King Cyrus, matching directly with what's written in the Bible. The clay cylinder was created around the 6th century BC and was found in the ruins of Babylon, which is located in modern Iraq. Cyrus was the founder of the Persian Empire. He ruled Persia for most of his life until 530 BC, when he died at the age of 70. Etched onto the cylinder is an account of how the Persian king successfully conquered the Babylonian capital in 539 BC. But it also says that Cyrus completed a grand gesture after conquering the city. He allowed certain groups of people to return to their homelands. Tom Meyer says this is just like the proclamation made in the Bible, in which Cyrus allows the Jewish people held prisoner in Babylon to go back to Jerusalem. If correct, this is another shocking revelation that proves the Bible is much more than just a storybook. Big shout out to Kelly Smith for the super thanks! This is so helpful for us to keep making more videos and creating more fun things, so big thank you to Kelly! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join us for more videos about mysterious discoveries and strange history. Our Ancestral Home According to ancient astronaut theorists, the Anunnaki were extraterrestrial explorers who came to our planet thousands of years ago to mine gold. The Anunnaki, beings worshipped by the earliest civilizations in Mesopotamia, supposedly used the human race to mine gold for them, then abandoned the planet and left humans to their own devices. Some believe the mining operations took place primarily in South Africa, and that these operations even predate Sumer and Mesopotamia by thousands of years. It's a very strange theory, yet a new discovery seems to be helping. According to a report from The Guardian, Scientists recently traced the origins of all humans to South Africa, the same place where the Anunnaki supposedly began mining gold. Scientists used over 1,000 samples of mitochondrial DNA to identify the region as the birthplace of all humans. Specifically, human life allegedly began in a wetland that once covered most of modern-day Botswana. Researchers say a chunk of land south of the Zambezi River was a thriving ecosystem for Homo sapiens 200,000 years ago. In total isolation, a single population of modern humans existed here for an estimated 70,000 years. This doesn't confirm the Anunnaki ever existed or that they mined gold, but it is an interesting thing to think about, and it definitely changes what we know about the origins of our own species. Mysterious Medieval Manuscripts Researchers in Romania recently came across a trove of medieval manuscripts that could redefine what we know about Eastern European history. The manuscripts were found in the small town of Medias, hidden in the St. Margaret's Church. Over 200 books and texts, some dated back to the 9th century AD. Adenal Dinka from Babis Bulya University says the books were part of a large church library one that has since been forgotten. Church records show that as recently as 1864, St. Margaret's had a collection of over 7,700 books. Yet now there is only a fraction of that, with some early printed works of important figures like Martin Luther and John Calvin. The church was originally built by a group of Transylvanian Saxons who settled in Romania in the 15th century. The collection was uncovered in the church tower, likely hidden during the First World War to protect them. Then they were forgotten until recently discovered. 
The even bigger mystery, though, is trying to find the other 7,500 books, all of which seem to have vanished without a trace. Researchers are still working to understand the collection and are hoping the lost books will reveal hidden secrets about medieval Romania and Eastern Europe, ancient Mesopotamia. Recent excavations at the ancient complex of Girzu in Iraq could be rewriting the history of Mesopotamia. For decades, historians have held the firm belief that the ancient civilization of Sumer reached such fantastic heights because they mastered irrigation. The simple luxury of having regular fresh water available to all citizens was what pushed them to make advancements in writing, architecture, and city planning. But the new discoveries at Girzu seem to suggest that wasn't the case at all. Girzu was built by the Sumerians around 3000 BC. Sebastian Ray and his team of scientists used drones to fly across the site and gather images, hoping to understand what kind of irrigation system was used. But they were shocked to discover most of the irrigation canals were dug about 1,000 years before the main city was built, prior to the transition from primitive settlement to urban metropolis. What this means is that irrigation was not the key nor the spark to urbanization and the invention of the first written language. That's a huge discovery and has already changed our knowledge of Mesopotamia and human development. To put things as simply as possible, the Sumerians mastered irrigation long before they became the advanced civilization we know them as today. Scientists are still stumped as to what eventually inspired or motivated them to move from primitive farmers to advanced city dwellers. What do you think inspired human civilization as we know it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Vikings in Colorado We all know the Vikings were masters of the sea. They raided coastal Europe between the 8th and 11th centuries, and they even found North America centuries before Christopher Columbus. We know beyond any doubt that the Vikings landed in Newfoundland, Canada and built two settlements. But some also believe the Vikings reached the other side of North America, landing on the shores of California. Not only is there a Spanish galleon supposedly lost under the sands of the Colorado desert, but a Viking ship too. In March of 1933, Myrtle Botts and her husband were hiking near the Mexican border. They came into contact with a prospector who told them that while searching for gold, he found a wooden vessel near Cane Break Canyon. The vessel, according to the prospector, had the figure of a serpent carved into its brow, along with other obvious hallmarks of Viking craftsmanship. Myrtle and her husband went in search of the ship themselves, and apparently they saw it. However, it was so far away that they weren't able to physically reach the ship. They were going to attempt reaching it the next day, but were hindered by an earthquake that shook the ground and made them too nervous to go on. To this day, nobody has ever found the Viking ship. Some even claim the Viking ship and the Spanish galleon are the same, that it's one boat lost out there in the Colorado desert. If the ship turns out to have Viking origins, Every single history book in North America will need to be rewritten. Hyperinflation In 2022 and now, inflation has been a huge issue in just about every country around the globe. Everyone's talking about it, and yet it isn't the first time such a catastrophe has happened. During the Yuan Dynasty of China between 1278 and 1368, there was hyperinflation even worse than what we're seeing today. Some historians recently put forth a theory trying to explain what crushed the ancient Chinese economy. They believe it all had to do with the introduction of paper money. China was the first civilization on the planet to use paper currency. It's a well-documented fact. They used paper currency about 1,000 years earlier than the Europeans. But it may have been their reckless printing of the newly invented paper money that led to civil war rampant bloodshed, and an economic crash. Paper money was introduced around the year 1005, but it really took off at an industrial level by 1260. Within just 50 years of paper money becoming popular, it had depreciated by 1000%. One of the biggest issues were the aggressive Mongolian armies. China had no choice but to fund their own war with the Mongols wreaking havoc in the north and trying to invade Japan. 
Soon enough, so much paper money had been printed that it lost all value. By 1368, when the Ming Dynasty came into power, most towns and cities had already given up on paper money and moved back to a barter system. It could be that this economic disaster was what resulted in the death of the Yuan Dynasty in the first place. And now for number two. But be sure to stick around after this video if you haven't gotten enough for 10 more discoveries that could change history. The Marlow Warlord The Marlow Warlord was a formidable warrior who stood six feet tall and lived around the 5th century AD in Anglo-Saxon Britain. Six feet may not sound very large by today's standards, but he would have been a giant among men 1,500 years ago. His skeleton was discovered near Buckinghamshire town near Greater London, along with two bronze bowls and some ancient weaponry. Dr. Gabor Thomas was one of the archaeologists involved in the discovery. He says the warrior was uncovered at a site overlooking the Thames River, which suggests the deceased was either a warlord or a respected leader of a local tribe. Whatever the case, he had definitely been a formidable warrior. The discovery is interesting not only because it revealed a living giant from the days after the fall of the Roman Empire in Britain, it also shows how primitive life became after the Romans left. It looks like civilization largely fell into anarchy, and that warlords like the six-foot-tall giant filled the power vacuum. The Maya Calendar The various calendars of the Mesoamerican civilizations have long been used as examples of just how advanced people like the Maya were before the arrival of the Spanish. But new information has revealed something that's changing history. It looks like the Mesoamerican people were using the 260-day calendar several centuries earlier than previously thought. People along the southern Gulf Coast of Mexico were using this calendar as far back as 3,100 years. Not only did they keep track of time using a single calendar system, but they also aligned their buildings with the stars to track celestial movements across the sky. Scientists learn this by taking aerial surveys of ancient Maya lands, then analyzing the data to create extremely high-resolution images of the planet's surface. These surveys revealed over 100 architectural structures aligned specifically with the rising sun, waning moon, and other celestial objects, all of them based on the 260-day calendar. But some of these objects are old enough to push the dates when the Maya used the calendar way back they could have been using it even earlier than 3,100 years ago, which would mean the Maya were some of the very first astronomers in the world. They calculated the length of the tropical solar year, they studied the Milky Way, and they observed astronomical phenomena with the diligence of modern scientists. The only thing that remains unclear is why the Maya chose a 260-day calendar to represent the year, the early human that wasn't. In 1912, an amateur archaeologist named Charles Dawson claimed that human-like fossils were found in East Sussex, England. The country's top paleontologist announced that the newly discovered bones constituted a previously unknown human ancestor who lived around 500,000 years ago. Experts described the species as the link between humans and apes. These claims were turned on their head in 1949, when new technology showed that the remains were no more than 50,000 years old. By then, modern Homo sapiens had already emerged into existence, meaning that the Piltdown Man, as he had come to be called, couldn't possibly represent a missing link between us and apes. Further investigation proved that the fossils were bones from two different species, a human and an ape of some sort, perhaps an orangutan, and the artifacts had been stained to look like they matched the gravel at Piltdown. Soon enough, the verdict was in. The Piltdown Man was nothing more than an elaborate hoax. But why would someone go so far out of their way to lead science astray from fact? The first evidence that humans evolved in Africa came in the form of Homo erectus fossils that were discovered there in the late 19th century, shortly before the Piltdown Man appeared. But pervasive racism made many Europeans feel threatened by the growing body of evidence supporting this claim. By creating the illusion of the Piltdown Man, Europeans could claim that Britain played a prominent role in human evolution and that white people had evolved separately from black people. 
This is a huge problem in archaeology and history in general that is recorded by the victor and the most powerful people in society at the time. So when things don't go their way, they tend to twist or quash the truth. Many modern scholars argue that this is why people don't believe that ancient people could have been smart, and so amazing things from the past must have been created by aliens. First Nocturnal Dinosaur Around 65 million years ago, a strange genus of theropod dinosaurs called Shubuya roamed the desert in what is now Mongolia. These creatures came from the same group of dinosaurs that gave rise to modern-day birds. The only known Shuvuya species is Shuvuya deserti, which means desert bird. It was about half the size of a chicken with long legs, a fragile skull, and powerful arms equipped with single claws. Scientists have long known of the species' existence, but they only recently realized that it may have been the first dinosaur to hunt at night. A team member noticed that the creature's lagina, an organ that processes hearing, was unusually long. The team compared the species with CT scans of around 100 living birds and extinct dinosaurs. They also measured each species' scleral rings, which are the bones surrounding the pupils, to determine which animals were more likely to have operated in low light. They were surprised to learn that the barn owl, a nocturnal species with excellent hearing, was the only creature with a comparably long lagina to the Shuvuya. The Shuvuya's scleral ring was large in diameter, meaning it let in a lot of light, and perhaps enabled the animal to hunt in the dark. The creature's remarkable hearing helped it locate burrowing insects and small mammals. Then, it seized its prey by digging in one of its two large, singular claws. Several of the Shibuya's traits, including nocturnal activity, digging ability, and long hind limbs, are also seen in modern-day desert animals. The team also learned that most dinosaurs were primarily daytime creatures, and that predatory dinosaurs typically had good hearing compared to most birds. Early Trigonometry The ancient Greeks are widely credited with inventing the foundations of modern trigonometry, but a recent study suggests that the Babylonians may have used it 1,500 years earlier. The research examined a strange series of numbers on an ancient clay tablet fragment known as Plimpton 322 created in ancient Mesopotamia between 1822 and 1762 BC, a bizarre artifact has perplexed experts ever since its discovery. In 1945, researchers said that the tablet appears to contain evidence of a primitive form of trigonometry, but until recently, that's as close as they got to figuring it out. As part of the new study, Australian mathematician Daniel F. Mansfield sought to prove his theory that this type of math was developed for marking the boundaries when ownership of private property first came into practice. He found answers in Psi 427, a tablet that was made in Iraq sometime between 1900 and 1600 BC. It describes the sale of a plot of land and contains extremely precise information about its boundaries. Coupled with Plimpton 322, it appears as though the Babylonians developed geometry for creating accurate perpendicular lines. Mansfield backed up his claims with support from cultural texts, including a description of a senior scribe scolding a junior scribe for calculating dimensions improperly. See? Just like school today! While Mansfield's hypothesis remains unproven, it presents a solid argument justifying more research into the possibility that the Babylonians preceded the Greeks with their mathematical developments. If this happens to be the case, then it would attribute the beginnings of trigonometry to an entirely different culture and set its origins back over 1,000 years. Troy and the Trojan Horse were real Ancient Greek philosopher and poet Homer wrote about the Trojan War in his epic poem The Iliad, but he failed to mention the Trojan Horse. According to the Aeneid by fellow ancient Greek Virgil, the decade-long series of conflicts ended when Odysseus ordered his army to build the famous structure. Some of the best Greek soldiers crammed into the hollow vessel, and Odysseus fooled the Trojans into thinking it was a peace offering. Once inside the city walls, the Greeks emerged from the wooden horse and ravaged the Trojans, securing their victory in the seemingly endless war. For a long time, experts believed that Troy was a mythical place dreamt up in Homer's mind. German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann proved them wrong during the late 19th century, when he found and excavated much of the city in modern-day Turkey. This discovery posed a new question. How much of the stories about the Trojan War are true? Even after Troy's existence was proven, many scholars continue to doubt that there was ever really a Trojan horse. 
They thought that Virgil's reference to it was metaphorical in nature, perhaps relating to a natural disaster or a war machine, but not a big, clunky, literal wooden horse. Fast forward to this year, archaeologists at Troy began digging up dozens of strangely positioned wooden planks, with each beam measuring up to 49 feet long. The structure fits Virgil's description of the Trojan horse, and radiocarbon dating revealed that it was built sometime during the 12th or 11th century BC, which falls in line with the recorded dates for the Trojan War. So, is it the Trojan horse? Scientists haven't confirmed it, but all signs point toward this being the case. And it kind of makes you wonder if there are any other true stories out there that experts are mistakenly labeling as mythical. Atlantis, perhaps? Mediterranean whales and killer whales, also called orcas, are not known to frequent the Mediterranean today. In fact, not many whale species, period, are typically seen in the region, and none are known to breed there. Yet around 2,000 years ago during the first century, Pliny the Elder wrote about killer whales hunting whale calves near the Strait of Gibraltar. He described how the orcas viciously slaughtered mothers and their young in the Bay of Cadiz. Because there are no killer whales in that area today, some researchers assumed that Pliny was mistaking dolphins for orcas. But a 2018 study suggests that he may have been spot on with his observations. The research describes the discovery of bones belonging to North Atlantic right whales and Atlantic gray whales, which were found among the ruins of an ancient Roman fish processing facility along the Strait of Gibraltar. Unearthed in the ancient Roman city of Baelo Claudia near modern-day Tarifa, Spain, the evidence fits almost perfectly with Pliny's claims. Now, experts wonder if the Romans hunted whales. Along with the tuna and other large fish they were known for harvesting, ancient fishermen didn't have the technology to hunt large whales on the open sea, but they may have taken advantage of the opportunity to kill them while they were close to shore, according to lead study author Ana Rodriguez. She further explained that the study shows how even heavily studied regions still contain surprises from the past leaving one to wonder what else has been lost to history, or perhaps is still waiting to be discovered in places like the Mediterranean. Arctic Dinosaurs The world was much warmer 70 years ago than it is now, but the polar regions still saw below freezing temperatures and snowy winters. Believing that dinosaurs couldn't survive in these frigid conditions, Scientists long assumed that the creatures never stayed in these areas year-round. But they recently proved themselves wrong with the discovery of fossils from seven dinosaur species that were found as far north as 250 miles above the Arctic Circle. Some of the fossils are of eggs, suggesting that dinosaurs spent the winter in the region. Evidence of polar dinosaurs has also appeared in the Southern Hemisphere. These findings challenge the long-standing notion that all dinosaurs were cold-blooded. In order to survive in the Arctic, a species had to be at least somewhat warm-blooded, meaning that they were capable of warming their bodies enough to survive months of darkness and cold. Scientists are still piecing together the picture of what life was like for polar dinosaurs. It would have been especially hard for those really close to the poles, where darkness set in for six months every year and plant life ground to a halt. The condition would have possibly created a food crisis for any animals living there, unless they relied on a survival strategy that experts haven't identified yet, which, as things currently stand, seems entirely possible. So, how do you think these Arctic dinosaurs lived and survived close to the poles? Were they warm-blooded? Were they hibernating? Or do you think there's a different answer to this mystery? Women could be Viking warriors. Sometime during the mid-10th century, a high-ranking Viking military leader died and was laid to rest with two horses and an array of deadly weapons in what is now Berka, Sweden. When the grave was excavated in 1889, archaeologists simply assumed the individual was a man. But in 2014, osteologist Anna Kjellstrom noticed that the skeleton had delicate hip bones and feminine cheekbones. In 2017, a DNA analysis proved that the person was actually a female, an elite professional warrior who also happened to be a woman. She was at least 30 years old when she died and was around 5 feet 6 inches tall, which was tall for a woman of the time. In addition to her weapons and horses, the burial contained a board game complete with playing pieces. Some experts think that this may symbolize her role as a war strategist. But not all researchers agree on this or on the woman's role in her society. For now, though, most scholars seem to agree that the burial represents the first genetic proof that Viking women could be warriors. The Hiding Hobbits 
On the island of Flores in Indonesia, a very unusual species of human lived unbothered for about 640,000 years. Up until 60,000 years ago, the Homo floresiensis flourished in the hot and humid jungles of Southeast Asia. Scientists have nicknamed the species Hobbit because it only stood about three and a half feet tall, just over half as tall as modern humans. They also had very small brains and weirdly large feet. But perhaps the most curious part about this species is that scientists can't figure out where they evolved from. The hobbits don't appear to be represented anywhere on our family tree. They seem to have evolved out of nowhere and lived in Indonesia, but they never migrated to the rest of the world. Surprisingly, they might not be entirely gone yet. Gregory Forth, a retired anthropologist from the University of Alberta, believes Homo floresiensis is still alive. Gregory claims our ancient human ancestor didn't go extinct and is hiding in the unpopulated jungles of Indonesia. The island of Flores is about the size of Connecticut, approximately 5,996 square miles. It has a population of 2 million people spread across its lands. There are still some remote parts that are covered in nothing but jungle, but not as many as there used to be. John Hawks from the University of Wisconsin says the chance of a primitive human ancestor sustaining itself secretly in such a populated island is close to zero. In other words, somebody would have spotted a three and a half foot tall hobbit scurrying through the trees. Gregory Forth, on the other hand, is not so pessimistic. Gregory is confident that there is at least a small community of primitive people on Flores. He says they figured out a way to remain out of sight while living off the natural food provided by the jungle. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Mokele Mbembe Hiding deep in the jungles of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a dinosaur. At least that's what the legends say. Running free in the swampy marshlands and hidden lakes of the Congo's rural forests is an alleged creature called Mokele Mbembe. Locals say it lives primarily in the Lokuala region, but it's been spotted at multiple bodies of water. It's described as an amphibious creature with a bulky body, a long serpent-like neck, and a small head. The description of the monster matches exactly with the description of a sauropod from the age of the dinosaurs. It goes without saying that dinosaurs are extinct. There hasn't been a sauropod living on our planet for at least 65 million years. And yet, indigenous people from the Western Congo Basin have been talking about the monster for centuries. Their stories seem to suggest a family of sauropods living in complete isolation, deep in one of the most remote jungles on the planet. The theory is that somehow, a single group of dinosaurs has managed to survive all the way into modern times. The jungles of the Congo are so difficult to reach that there have been very few excavations to look for the dinosaur. Researchers Bill Gibbons and Mitchell Ballot have been looking for it for years, traveling between the Congo and Cameroon. But since nobody has ever documented the Mokele Mbembe, some say the creature may have migrated into Gabon, giants of the rainforest. Over 12,000 years ago, South America was home to some of the most marvelous Ice Age beasts you can imagine. There were giant ground sloths as big as a car, and there were huge elephantine herbivores that rampaged through the jungle. There were even weird deer-like creatures with long snouts like anteaters. All of these creatures are now extinct, but not forgotten. In 2022, researchers in the Colombian Amazon rainforest uncovered a giant wall of rock paintings at Serrania de la Lindosa. The paintings show the unimaginable diversity of ancient Amazonia. Turtles, fish, jaguars, porcupines, and extinct giants can all be seen scribbled on the wall. The prehistoric human inhabitants of the rainforest came face to face with these animals and drew pictures of them on the cliff wall in a magnificent mural. The giant beasts depicted here include an extinct camel and an extinct type of horse with a weirdly thick neck. There's also a three-toed hoofed mammal with an elephant trunk. Researchers were able to connect fossilized skeletons of these creatures to their paintings on the wall. All of the drawings were made with red pigment mined from nearby. 
But the strange thing is that no bones belonging to the animals were uncovered near the huge wall mural. This suggests they weren't a source of food for the prehistoric people who drew the pictures. It's making researchers wonder what the connection was between the giant beasts of the rainforest and its early human residents. If humans didn't hunt these animals to extinction, then what caused them to suddenly get wiped out? Lost Mayan Cities The Maya civilization had a very large presence in what is today the Guatemalan jungle. In 2018, laser scans aimed at the remote Guatemalan wilderness revealed ancient cities that once housed millions more Maya citizens than ever imagined. Archaeologists specializing in digital technology uncovered the ruins of over 60,000 houses and multiple palaces. They also discovered elevated highways cutting through the jungle and other mysterious features that have been hidden for centuries. Nobody ever saw them before because they are buried underneath the forest. They were only revealed using light detection and ranging technology, which involves mapping the terrain with lasers to remove natural obstruction like trees and foliage. Gone are the days you had to hack your way through with a machete. These days, the Guatemalan jungle is desolate. The landscape is unpopulated and has been for roughly 1,000 years. The discovery made by researchers like Thomas Garrison from Ithaca College suggests Central America supported an extremely advanced branch of the Maya civilization, which peaked 1,200 years ago. These people were so advanced that their cultures rivaled those of ancient Greece or China. It's just that everything they made has been eaten by the forest, and so it's been a nightmare for archaeologists to try and piece things together. But by the looks of it, they had complex urban centers connected by artificial roadways like superhighways. There was also an irrigation network to feed millions of people. The next step is for archaeologists to begin excavating these ancient cities. Right now, they are all still buried under the jungle. The ruins of a civilization of about 15 million people are waiting to be uncovered. If you were lost in the jungle, would you wait to be rescued? Or would you try to find your way back to civilization? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. The Olmec Heads The mysterious Olmec colossal heads were crafted by the pre-Maya civilization known as the Olmec. Each head is positively huge, with the biggest being over 11 feet tall and weighing 50 tons. Each one is distinctive because it's a representation of an important person in Olmec society. They were likely local rulers or great priests, maybe even kings. The first one was discovered hiding in the jungles of Tres Zapotes in Mexico in 1862. But it wasn't until 1938 that real interest in the Olmec stirred in the archaeological community. Since then, colossal heads have been found throughout Mexico and Guatemala. Unfortunately, many of the gigantic heads were taken out of the jungle to be put on display somewhere else. For that reason, dating them has been difficult. The oldest likely goes back about 3,000 years to 900 BC. The Olmec civilization blossomed starting around 1500 BC in what is now the Mexican state of Veracruz. They are considered the first truly advanced civilization that developed in Mesoamerica. Many researchers even believe the Olmec gradually transformed into the Maya and that their culture never really died. It merely evolved into something different. Whatever the case may be, the colossal heads they left behind are still some of the most incredible and mysterious relics found anywhere in the world. Plain Full of Skeletons A teenager in the Philippines was hunting birds in the jungle when he came across the body of an aircraft. It happened in 2015, and the wreckage was nothing short of horrific. The fuselage was supposedly full of skeletons and had the Malaysian flag on it. Authorities believed it may have come from the missing flight MH370 that disappeared on March 8, 2014. It departed from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia with 227 passengers and 12 crew members. On its way to Beijing, the plane and its occupants vanished into thin air and have never been found. The fuselage, which is the main body of an airplane, was discovered in the coastal jungle in Tawi-Tawi. 
The young man who made the grim discovery claimed that he found a skeleton sitting in the pilot seat, and it was still wearing its flight equipment. There were other skeletons there as well, some wearing seat belts and some strewn around the wreckage. Because the teenager didn't have access to television or international news, he had no idea the significance of what he'd found. All he could do was go back to his village and tell others, and they spread the news to the authorities. What's really strange is that after the discovery was made and reported by just about every major news outlet, the story vanished. Authorities said they were going to investigate the skeleton-filled fuselage, but then we never heard anything else about it. Either it was just a made-up story, or someone covered up a plane full of bodies. Maya Ballplayers Two mysterious carvings have been found at the jungle ruins of Tipan Chen Uitz in Belize. The carvings appear to depict Maya ballplayers from about 1400 years ago. Researchers say the discovery of the carvings is bringing new insight into the violent and bloodthirsty games played by the Maya. It's not totally clear what the carvings are meant to depict. One of them shows a man wearing a heavy belt and holding a staff with streamers waving in the wind. Experts say this individual may have been a fan of the game. Hieroglyphics on the stone mention a ball with the span of nine hands. Nobody knows how big that is in Maya terms, but it seems to suggest the ball used in the sport was huge. The second panel appears to show a player in the middle of striking the ball with his left hand. The carvings were likely part of the front wall of an ancient stadium. There may have been dozens or even hundreds of these panels outside the stadium depicting players, fans, and other aspects of the game. But for archaeologists, the rules of the game are still a huge mystery. Evidence seems to suggest the game was played for two weeks between a pair of rival teams. Then, as a reward, the captain of the winning team was decapitated. The Maya may have believed it was a great honor to win a game and be sacrificed to the gods for your victory. If you wanted to stay alive, you had to play to lose. Fossilized Tick Roughly 20 million years ago, a monkey was in the jungle of the Dominican Republic grooming one of its friends. The monkey picked tiny ticks out of its pal's fur. One of those ticks, after being flicked into obscurity by the monkey, landed in a piece of wet sap. Over time, that sap hardened and turned into solid amber. Then, millions of years later, the amber was picked up in a mine deep in the Cordillera Septentrional mountain range. The fossilized tick is now believed to be the only example of red blood cells from an ancient mammal preserved in amber. The tick gorged itself on blood from a monkey, then was trapped before the blood could be digested into a meal. Researchers not only identified the blood cells, but they also discovered pathogens living inside the cells. The preserved specimen revealed the presence of parasites in the tick's gut. Most of them appeared to belong to the order Pyroplasmida, a group of parasites that are still around today. The same kinds of parasites that infected the monkey still infect humans and cattle. In fact, these parasites and pathogens are known for causing flu-like symptoms in people, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. It makes you wonder what could happen if a 20-million-year-old pathogen like this were accidentally released into the modern human population. Creepy Jungle Glowworms A very bizarre creature was discovered in the Peruvian jungle in 2014. It's kind of like a glowworm, and it's nothing short of creepy. Wildlife photographer Jeff Creamer was hiking through the Peruvian Amazon at night when he spotted bright points of light on the ground. It almost looked as if someone had left neon paint splashed on the jungle floor. But when Jeff got closer, he realized these were living creatures. The heads of bioluminescent larvae looked right back at him. But because Jeff isn't a biologist, all he could do was take some pictures and show them to some scientists. Jeff returned to the place where he found the glowing worms with a trio of entomologists. Sure enough, Jeff had found something remarkable. These larvae were glowing bright green in order to attract prey. The researchers knew this because of the way the larvae waited totally still with their jaws wide open. They were patiently waiting for creatures to get close enough, then they would snap their jaws shut and feast on their prey. 
Although these critters look like worms, they are in fact beetle larvae. The only issue for scientists is trying to figure out what kind of beetle the glowing larvae will grow into. The scientists in Peru still have a lot of research to do. There are over 10,000 species of beetle in the family Elateridae, and 200 of them are able to glow in the dark. The Mysterious Pyramids In 1976, one of NASA's satellites captured something strange while orbiting the planet. The Landsat satellite took a picture of some mysterious dots located in the jungles of southern Peru. These strange dots were photographed in the Madre de Dios region of the Amazon, or the Mother of God region. The dots appeared to be symmetrically placed structures, sort of like pyramids. There appeared to be eight of them divided into four rows of two. These quickly became known as the Pyramids of Paratuari, but since they were never photographed, nobody has ever been able to find them. It's not like researchers didn't try. The discovery excited the world of archaeology because the lost city of Paititi was believed to be in the same area as the pyramids. People began to whisper that the pyramids of a lost civilization were hiding in the rainforest, but they had been swallowed almost entirely by vegetation over thousands of years. A number of expeditions were carried out in order to uncover the pyramids, but all of them turned up nothing. Explorer Gregory Diarmenjian was one of the most fanatical believers in the pyramids. He undertook several expeditions between 1984 and 2011, and he found some pretty interesting stuff. He discovered mysterious petroglyphs in the jungle and the Inca remains of Mameria. He also uncovered paved roads, abandoned plazas, and other evidence of Inca occupation, but no pyramids. He finally admitted the pyramids spotted by the Landsat satellite were likely nothing but sandstone formations. Mystery Jar Burials In the spring of 2019, researchers working with the French National Institute for Preventive Archaeological Research made a grisly discovery. On the Mediterranean island of Corsica, they stumbled across a site filled with unearthed ancient tombs. They found an overflowing graveyard with roughly 40 burials, dating between 1,700 and 1,400 years old. When the researchers went back in 2021 to excavate the graves, they made an even more shocking discovery. They found human remains scattered with shards of ceramic. This was a little strange because ceramic vessels were used between the 3rd and 6th centuries for transporting liquids like olive oil and wine. However, they were scattered throughout the graveyard and were mixed with pieces of human bone. Researchers soon found out why when they discovered a broken jar with a shattered skeleton inside of it. As it turned out, people here were buried inside the giant jars known as amphorae. It was only one of many ways that the people of the island buried their dead. Some of the tombs were found cut into rock like in ancient Egypt. Others were more Roman in style, with tiled ceilings and clean floors. One individual was buried in a set of nested ceramic pots, and others were laid to rest in oversized jars. The most confusing part of all is that people didn't really practice jar burials except when it came to funerary rituals and infants. Multiple societies in Europe buried infants in jars, though nobody is really sure why. It's very rare that full-grown adults are found buried in huge wine jars. To this day, researchers are still struggling to figure out what ancient group of people buried their dead in this bizarre way, and what the significance was. The Cult of Aphrodite Archaeologists discovered something amazing in a mysterious cemetery in Russia, found within an ancient establishment on the coast of the Taman Peninsula. They unearthed the burial of a priestess from a strange cult dedicated to the worship of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. Aphrodite was worshipped thousands of years ago all throughout the Mediterranean, and yet this mysterious burial was found near the Black Sea in southern Russia, far from Greece. The burial dates back 1,900 years to the 1st century AD. This amazing recent find was made by archaeologists Nikolai Sudarev and Mikhail Treister in 2022. Within the priestess's grave was a shiny silver medallion with the image of Aphrodite on it, along with the signs of the zodiac. 
It's believed that these types of medallions were used by people in ancient times obsessed with astrology. By having the medallion in their possession, they thought it connected them to the celestial bodies in the heavens and helped them navigate their lives on Earth. This discovery proves that the cult of Aphrodite spread far beyond the borders of ancient Greece. The goddess was worshipped across much of Europe, revered as a deity of pleasure, passion, lust, and love. Whoever this woman in the grave was, she had likely held a position of power within the cult. She wore the great silver medallion around her neck and would have been treated just like any ordinary priest would today. Pompeii Chariot One of the most celebrated archaeological discoveries of 2021 was a chariot found in the fabled city of Pompeii. The chariot was once drawn by four horses. It was likely used in lavish ceremonies and then destroyed with the rest of Pompeii. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, the chariot was mostly obliterated and its remains were covered in volcanic ash. What's truly amazing about this discovery is the state of preservation the chariot was found in. Archaeologists were shocked to see that the chariot was mostly intact. They learned that it was made from beech wood and it was coated in red and black paint. They also found traces of the ropes that were used for the horse's harnesses. It's currently the only chariot of its kind ever found intact in Italy from the days of ancient Rome. However, the chariot isn't the only discovery they made here. It was uncovered inside a suburban villa near the stable, parked in the ancient equivalent of a garage. Near the chariot were the remains of three horses, one that was preserved in volcanic ash still wearing its harness. The chariot was seated on huge iron wheels and used an advanced mechanical system to operate. This kind of vehicle most likely wasn't used for roaming around town, though. Instead, it would have been reserved for elite Roman ceremonies. Mummy Juice In the port city of Alexandria, located on the northern shore of Egypt, archaeologists discovered one of the most horrific burial chambers ever found. They uncovered one huge sarcophagus with the bodies of three people floating in a murky red liquid. It was a truly disturbing find. The sarcophagus itself was pure black and made from solid granite. It was discovered in the Sidi Gaber district by archaeologists who couldn't believe there were three ancient mummies inside of it. These weren't your typical Egyptian mummies either. They had seriously decayed and were little more than fleshy skeletons as if they had been left to boil in a pot for too long. The discovery was so bizarre that locals flocked to the site to try and get bottles full of the gross mummy juice inside the sarcophagus. There were rumors of an ancient curse being unleashed with the opening of the sarcophagus, and many people believed the liquid had some kind of supernatural power. There were rumors going around that it was some kind of elixir of immortality. However, it's a good thing nobody was allowed to steal the liquid. Researchers analyzed the mummy juice and found that it was nothing but sewage water. The granite sarcophagus was found buried underneath the modern city, and it had been subjected to years of sewage leakage. Researchers believe the sewage water from a nearby building leaked through a small crack in one side of the sarcophagus, filling it with water. This liquid then helped to melt the remains inside, which resulted in a nasty human soup, steeped in sewage broth. Chankai Burial Dolls Almost nothing is known about the mysterious Chankai culture of Peru. Because they left behind no written records, all the information we have about them comes from archaeological evidence. And unfortunately, that's not very much. We know the culture likely existed from between 1000 and 1400 AD in the valleys of Chankai and Chillon, located on Peru's central coast. The more famous Chimu culture invaded the southern territories and conquered many parts of their kingdom. However, around 1450 AD, both the Chimu and the Chankai were conquered by the mighty Inca Empire. Some of the few artifacts the Chankai left behind are dolls. They had an obsession with producing huge clay dolls with unrealistic proportions. These dolls had gigantic heads, tiny legs, and large hands with only three fingers. They've also found evidence that the Chankai produced fabric, but what they are really known for today is their production of dolls. The Chankai burial dolls are the strangest of them all. They were made from woven fabric and were stuffed with reed, fiber, or small grains. 
The tiny dolls would then be dressed and have huge dramatic facial features sewn onto them. They were quite impressive, and each doll would be holding a significant item in one hand, something like yarn or a musical instrument. Since there's no written records, archaeologists can only speculate on the purpose of these highly unique dolls. They were most likely meant to represent human beings. And because they were only found in graves, they must have had some funerary importance. They could have been representations of servants that would come alive in the afterlife to help the deceased. The Jovial Skeleton A recently discovered mosaic in Turkey seems to suggest that even 2,300 years ago, people had a sense of humor. Archaeologists estimate that the piece of art was likely created in the 3rd century BC. The mosaic depicts a rather jovial skeleton, with a big smile on his face and a drink in his hand. The Greek inscription on the mosaic reads, Be cheerful, enjoy life. It's the ancient equivalent of modern-day inspirational quotes like, Don't worry, be happy, or live, laugh, love. Archaeologist Demet Kara from the Hatay Archaeological Museum said the jovial skeleton was found in the dining area of a contemporary house. The residence was built in the city of Antioquia, a city that grew to be one of the largest in the world during the Roman era. The mosaic is shocking evidence that ordinary men and women in ancient times not only had a sense of humor, but also had similar decoration tastes to what we do today. This mosaic is comparable to a humorous welcome mat that you may see on someone's front porch. And amazingly, it was found in the kitchen of an ordinary family's home. The Mummified Toddler After 400 years, scientists have finally solved the mystery of a mummified toddler that was discovered in a wooden coffin deep in the crypt of the Counts of Starhemberg in Austria. The crypt belonged to one of the oldest aristocratic families in the nation with the coffin dating back to the 17th century. Researchers from Germany believe the mummified boy was Reichard Wilhelm, who perished sometime between 1625 and 1626. The crypt contained several other members of the family, each one buried in an intricately decorated metal coffin. However, for some odd reason, the coffin of the young boy was made of wood and was found unmarked and undecorated. Researchers wanted to know why the child was buried in a dull wooden box and how he became naturally mummified. In order to solve this mystery, they used CT scans and radiocarbon dating. According to Andreas Nerlich, the lead author of this study, the infant was between 12 and 18 months old when he died. He had deformed ribs, indicating that he may have suffered from a metabolic bone disease. They believe the infant likely developed something called rachitic rosary, which is when knobs of bone grow at the junction of ribs and cartilage. This is something that usually only appears in severe cases of scurvy, but somehow afflicted this small child. They also found inflammation in the boy's lungs, meaning he may have had pneumonia as well. What researchers concluded was that this child may have never seen the sun, or he at least had a severe vitamin D deficiency. In the 17th century, members of the upper class were notorious for avoiding sunlight because pale skin was desirable. It could be that this child suffered serious illnesses because his parents kept him inside. Then, when he died prematurely, they placed him in a box deep in the crypt like they were burying a bad memory. The Last Maya Stronghold A new excavation project has unearthed some amazing artifacts at the site of Tayasal in Guatemala. This outpost is believed to have been the very last Maya city to stand strong against the Spanish conquest. It was first inhabited by the Maya around 900 BC and was the very last place to fall when the conquistadors invaded. Believe it or not, this didn't take place too long ago. The Spanish conquered the city in 1697, over a century after Europeans began pillaging Central America. Even though the Spanish had already gained control of the entire civilization, they just couldn't leave the last standing stronghold alone. And so, they entered the small outpost and decimated the population. According to Suarlin Cordova, who was involved in the recent study, the jungle was partially responsible for the safety of Tayasal. The thick vegetation of Guatemala acted as a natural border, hindering the Spanish for over 100 years. But unfortunately, the Spanish eventually made their way through the thick jungle and attacked the city. 
Now, archaeologists have managed to uncover human remains, ceramics, and bullets from Spanish guns. There is no way to say for sure if these bullets were used to slaughter the last few remaining Maya in Tayasal, but it certainly looks that way. Gold Belt in a Beet Field In the Czech Republic, an ordinary beet farmer came across one of the most valuable artifacts ever found in the country. The farmer was busy working on his property when he discovered a crumpled sheet of gold sticking out of the dirt. The frail and mysterious object turned out to be nearly 2,500 years old and proved to be extremely important. He sent photos of it to local archaeologists, who quickly arrived to see just what the farmer had uncovered. They now believe the sheet of gold is a belt from the Bronze Age. It was likely the front part of a leather belt and it's in almost perfect condition. Expert Teresa Kilnar is currently at work stabilizing and analyzing the belt at the Museum Bruntal. She's estimated that the gold belt dates back to the 14th century BC. This was a time when Central Europe was a blend of various cultures connected by a large trading network. Farmers grew wheat and livestock, society was on the verge of becoming complex, and a hierarchy was just starting to form. This discovery is so new that not much is known about the belt at the moment. We still don't even know if the object is part of a larger treasure hoard buried in the beet farmer's field. It was found on the surface, suggesting there could be a lot more hidden under the dirt. During the Bronze Age, gold wasn't exactly common. It was usually buried with powerful individuals, and chances are the gold belt came from a wealthy person's grave, likely hiding beneath the beet field. Ancient Egyptian Boats Archaeologists found over 120 images of ancient Egyptian boats scrawled on the walls of a mysterious building in Abydos. The building is at least 3,800 years old and was built near the burial place of Pharaoh Senwosret III. Although the building is empty now, Joseph Wegner from the Penn Museum at the University of Pennsylvania says there is a good chance that it once held a real wooden boat. Archaeologists did happen to find a few planks from that alleged boat, but they were little more than decayed sticks. It's believed that 3,800 years ago, the walls of this building would have been covered with way more than 120 illustrations. Some of the white plaster on the interior walls has survived the centuries, and there's still a lot of images of ships that can be seen right now. But back then, there could have been thousands of these pictures. This discovery is extremely strange because researchers have no idea what it all means or who created the drawings in the first place. They think this building could have been used in some kind of grand ceremony, but nothing else like it has ever been found in Egypt before. The boat that was once housed here may have been part of a burial ritual, or maybe it was some sacred artifact that deserved its own temple. For now, this place remains a mystery. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next time. Bye.